What is up, everybody? WTF. Welcome to Funkatopia. I hope everybody is uh, doing well. And uh, I see somebody is trying to call me. I hope it's not somebody important, but I'm sure that it's not. <laughs> Who's going to wow. be? Uh, What's happening, people? I know it looks like we're having some Facebook issues already. Are we really? Yeah, it looks like right off the bat we're not uh, getting anything going over there. I think there's a streaming issue. Okay. Well, not hold fun. on a second. Uh, well, we can't end the stream and come back. Um, that's kind of weird. Yeah. Hey, April and Claire, we're glad you're here and we're happy and all the other people, but it's yeah. weird. It shows numbers, but we can't see them in the chat and some other things. I'm going to check Facebook now to see what's coming up. Oh, hold on, let me see what I got here. Let's see if I can kind of get some things moving. But that's the reason why we do the pre show. Right. Uh, um, yeah, let's see. Pre show, pre show. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of weird. Yeah, I don't. Um, mm. I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will resolve itself. Let's. <laughs> Let's hope it resolves itself eventually. I don't uh, even see it there. Well, it says, um, I wonder if I can just, let me let me see if I can remove you guys' Facebook and then put you back on. Welcome to the pre-show. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you can go to YouTube.com slash Funkatopia if you're having issues on Facebook. Again, YouTube.com slash Funkatopia. It's the same exact thing, different platform. But I'm going to take... Uh, Facebook, I'm going to drop you for a second, but then I'll bring you right back, uh, hopefully, because I don't want to end the stream because then that's going to change the link and cause problems for Scotty. So uh, give me one second. Facebook, guys, I'm sorry. Hold on. I'll be right back. We're going to remove you just for a minute. Uh, funky, 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 funky times. Yeah, let's go ahead and do this. Um, make sure oh. everybody's okay. Hopefully, we're not going to get kicked off. Hold on. Facebook's about to be kicked off. I see all you fine folks on YouTube. I see how you are. I see you. Yeah. Krista, Joni, Samantha. Well, all right, guys. All right, guys. Yeah. Hold on. I'm adding I'm adding Facebook back in. We'll get this. We'll get this worked there out. Find out. There it is. What's up, Facebook folks? Hello. There we go. <laughs> WTF. Welcome to Funkatopia. I am your host, Mr. Christopher. This is my illustrious co-host, Mr. Jeff Page. <laughs> And uh, for the for the person that left me a message on my uh, cell phone just a minute ago, I will call you after the show. Uh, it is about a um, it's about next week's show, <laughs> so I can't I can't pick it up right now because we're in the middle of the live show. But I will call you back. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> so I can't I can't pick it up right. What's happening? That was you. That was me. That was nice. me. Things. I, did. Oh, I know I'd interrupted, but I make sure it's uh it's good. You guys keep playing with stuff, but welcome one and all. I hope everybody's doing well. Kiaria, what is going on? Christina, what's going on? Claire from Honolulu. April from Tampa uh, is going to be safe travels to New York. You're going to New York. That's pretty cool. Uh, I know. Oh, Christine is in Minneapolis. Yes. Thank you for telling, letting us know where you are. Uh, yes. Tonight we have the amazing sound engineer scotty baldwin on the show tonight yes. and what's cool about this and a little bit unusual is that uh he is actually in china right now <laughs> just he's in china so he's literally on the other side of the world uh in china and so when he joins us please be delicate and nice and don't speak loud because it is no joke 12 hours behind us so it is eight o'clock in the morning where he is right <laughs> give, give, give the guy a break you know? let him eat some breakfast first need some coffee <laughs> uh yeah and so we got a lot of really cool things i know we're going to be going live here in about uh no kind of think we're already live but we're really not live yet um but yeah it's going to be we are live but the show doesn't start until 8 p.m we're just going to welcome everybody welcoming uh, everybody. in china and uh stop pressing that button <laughs> <laughs> it's more fun it's pre-show no Get it's not oh my gosh uh anyways so what's kind of neat is we are um we are actually going to be both jeff page and myself i'm going to let you guys know this right here 
uh, we are actually going to be in Minneapolis on April 20th and 21st. Well, April 20th and 21st, Jeff is leaving early on the 21st, but we'll, we'll both be there on the weekend to catch that brothers show with Michael Bland and Sonny T and uh, we're going to be hanging out in Minneapolis and doing the thing. And it's going to be a fun, it's going to be a blast. Yeah, so, if, sure. if, so whoever is, uh, so if you guys are going to actually be somewhere around, please make sure that, uh, come yell at us. Yeah. We're, we're, I, I normally will do the normal hops in Minneapolis. Um, you know, I'll all see, um, I won't go to Paisley park until the 21st. Just because I know that uh, uh, we're going to talk about this in the in the later part of the show, but uh, on the twenty first, there Paisley Park is actually doing an entire event where uh, it starts at ten o'clock in the morning and until four thirty. I want to say it is. Mm-hmm. I think it's four thirty. They are it, um, it's open. Paisley Park is open, so you can wander around for free in Paisley Park. Um, and then at 421, they're doing, um, which is the date, but at 421, they are doing a uh, candlelight ceremony. So I was going to go into uh, Paisley Park and do the can or not Paisley. I was going to do it across the street mm-hmm. uh, and do Paisley Park um, and do the candlelight ceremony down there that night. But I'm leaving that night. And since Paisley Park is already doing a candlelight ceremony inside of Paisley Park, um, I'm just not, I don't want to do anything that conflicts with that. It doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah, it's going to so, be too. I mean, it's going to be a good time. I'm sure it's, you know, be there and, you know, be in that environment and it's the time to be here there. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's just one of these weird moments, um, where, um, hold on a second. Scotty is asking, asking me to resend the link. So I'm going to resend the link here. Um, it's an unusual time because not only are we there to to uh, enjoy the actual show that's going to be happening on 420, which we'll talk about after after Scotty's interview. Uh, but on top of that, 421 is the this upcoming 421 is the eighth eight year anniversary of Prince's passing, and so we'll be there to kind of take it all in and just. Uh, you know, just absorb it and take it all in. Yeah, breathe. And, um, you know, but I, I will typically go and do my do the old haunts when I first get there. I normally every single time I fly in, I normally fly in right around lunchtime, and I'll immediately go to Mall of America and grab lunch somewhere at Mall of America. I don't know where it's at. I mean, it's just this massive, massive, huge, insane mall. Okay. Um, and uh, it is the, I want to say, and people in the um. Uh, people in the area may may know this. I think it's the largest mall in the continental continental United States, not in the world. I think in the world there's one that's somewhere in Europe, I believe, right. Right. that is larger than anything. But in the in the United States, it's it's this one. So uh, oh, I normally go and have lunch, and then I'll go to Cheapos probably to pick up, um, you know. Just to see if I can do a little vinyl searching. I don't know why I keep buying vinyl because I don't. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I literally don't. Um, I buy vinyl, but a lot of times I don't even take the time to sit down and actually listen to them. Uh, right. I'm I, actually I, coming in before you. Um, I think I'm flying in before you. So um, I'll, I'll actually be there and uh, I'm going to go to breakfast. So. I, I don't know where to go yet, but I'll be looking for a really good breakfast spot. The so. original pancake house is always a great place to stop. Yeah, that's that's the one. So uh, that's probably where I'll end up going. <laughs> yeah. There there's tons of there's a lot of great breakfast places in uh, Minneapolis, but one of my favorite places to stop for breakfast is the original pancake house. There's a few of them, but there's one that I always specifically go to. Right. Uh because they have some amazing breakfast. I mean, it's just you got to be not counting carbs. That's the first thing. Uh, oh, right. Just, just be done. <laughs> just don't even, don't even bother doing that because it's pancakes. <laughs> and I mean, they've got everything: pancakes, eggs, and everything else. But you know. Oh, but uh, it'll be pancakes. That's 
Oh, okay, sorry. And, and Krista says, hey, Yes, Jeff, Krista, I do. I do. I want some pancakes. <laughs> and Kiara says, There's an IHOP right across the street. We have IHOPs here. Yeah, I'm not going to go to IHOP. Nobody no, wants to go to IHOP. I have an IHOP. I can go to IHOP anytime. They can wait. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be all right. Uh, I know every day they're like, is he coming today? But, you know, guys, sorry, <laughs> I hoppers. Uh, hold on a second. I'm just sending, in, sending a text to... Uh, uh, let's go. Yeah. And uh, we are at the uh, the 8 o'clock hour to go into the full show. So, uh, yeah. It, well, it's, it's well... I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to break it because we have the you know the the video portion that we have to do here. But again, if you're just joining us, uh, we're we're kind of gone beyond right the pre-show into the actual live part of the show. We're waiting for Scotty to join us. He's in the process of of logging in right now. He is in China, so while we are all nice and rested, uh, he's just getting up. I mean, he's nice and rested too. I mean, he actually has a full. We're worn out from the day. <laughs> He's rested. <laughs> I would switch anytime. And I, I see Scotty, I see Scotty logging in. To yeah, China yeah. Right now I'm and, jealous. And he, yeah. he oh, I've me. never been to China, but Scotty's been everywhere in the world. Uh, oh, yeah. I, probably twice. Probably, probably twice. All right. So he is in the green room. So let's go ahead and start. So uh, let me just go ahead and tell you right now. Thank you guys so, so much as we normally do. I'm going to bring our guest in. If you have any questions, please put them into the chat room. Uh, Jeff Page tries to keep a good eye on some of the really great questions, and he like tags them and stars them. So don't don't feel offended if like 15 minutes pass and we haven't read your question yet. Sometimes some things that you're asking align with what we're going to talk about later in the interview. So I don't put them in. So just hang tight. Everything's going to be great. And uh, so, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Funkatopia. Tonight, we have a very, very special guest that is joining us from China right now. And he is one of the sound engineer extraordinaires. And he's joining us today and he has worked with everybody. I mean, literally Lady Gaga, Madonna, Prince. It, and obviously, it's an honor to have him here. Ladies and gentlemen, let me bring him to the stage right now, Mr. Scotty Baldwin. <laughs> when you said tonight, it's weird to me because it's it's just morning. I just came from the breakfast room in the hotel, so uh, um, this is uh, quite strange. But it's quite nice to be here. Okay, at so this early hour. You, do you know what else is strange know. about that? Is behind you, you've got the window open, so it's all bright, and it's yeah. you know getting dark here. So it's like, oh, <laughs> That's right. unless we were in eclipse totality, then it would be the same. Right? Hey, man, there it is for so, at least a few minutes. Did they have the, I mean, what was it eclipse in totality over there? Not, not a, not a peep about it. Um, it was fun to watch uh, over in the U S how excited people were about the, uh, the eclipse, <laughs> but over here it was just, I, we weren't in the path of it at all. I was hoping we would be, and I don't know why I thought it would be worldwide, but you just had that beautiful shadow of the moon, just kind of something poetic about that and magical it made people cry. People got married. There are all sorts of things happening. That's really special. That, those kind of, those kind of special things that are so viscerally impactful to our lives only happen really in the natural world once in a while, right? We Everything else we do is through technology. So to be there, um, I was going to send, my wife and I were going to send our daughters down to Austin to our relatives down there to to see the, the thing, the uh, eclipse. And then when I found out what ticket prices were, just to get them down there i know you know the airline the airlines were like okay here's this strip of land we're gonna triple our prices just for this area right there so everybody's looking to make a buck somehow i i've always said if you could if somehow elon musk could find a way to block out sunsets and then charge you for them he would for sure there <laughs> but fortunately we're not there yet yeah for sure i, I saw a guy recreate the eclipse he goes for those who aren't in totality and they had to the guy and he oh no, no. And he like walked in front of the sun in front of the screen and i was like yes that's, yeah. we, that's hilarious that's for hilarious. us in in uh in georgia in atlanta i get we're like 85 percent, so it didn't really yeah. get dark like that so i kind of did my own mock thing i set up a camera and i walked past it naked backwards it was cool it was it was pretty cool <laughs> you know when i was a kid we went through one of those and we we poked a hole in a piece of paper. Yep. And then you would just like look at the sidewalk. And so I mean, we were we were smart back then. We didn't look up at the sun. 
um we yeah. just kind of looked at the ground and went oh yeah looks like an eclipse and then went and you know just did what we were doing it only lasts for a minute so you have to grab it while you can yeah you're you're about the same age as we are uh we're 68 so i think you're a 67 right yes so, correct uh, so it, it was around the same time i think we use shoe boxes yes that's right, <laughs> that's right. Like, sometimes like fake projector scenarios so yeah it was I get it. Uh, man, it is such an honor to have you here, man, because I mean, I'll be honest, you know, I, I didn't start hearing your name until, uh, honestly, you know, I knew what shows sounded great, uh, whenever I saw Prince in concert and what shows, you know, probably could have done a little bit more tweaking, uh, sound engineer wise, but some of the like greatest shows that I experienced, including Prince piano and a microphone. Um, I was just like, man, whoever's doing the sound is just like, killing right. it and then of course the the clip started appearing on uh on youtube i guess where he where he mentioned you and calls you out and it was like wow okay that's that's really cool because that's not something that he normally does he'll call out band members but somebody extraneous that's not you know not superfluous but extraneous that's outside and off the stage is doesn't normally right. that's right normally that's get call out. Thing. Yeah. And it's an, and, and it is an important, um, I don't want to make it too important. It was part of his process, but I will say that when, when an artist, um, inserts you into their art and his art was music. And when he actually made m calling me out as a, a punctuative effect into his music, that's a big deal to me. I understand. I always understood the gravity and how much I appreciated him saying that as a sort of a punctuation of of turn it up scotty you know that was the the that that was that was a punctuation um luckily i had a cool enough name you know that was fun enough to say you know my name wasn't fred or something you know um <laughs> yeah it, it, so it, it always kind of was it was his go-to you know it was this go-to uh punctuation and 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 just for those who may have missed it or if you don't remember uh let me play 10 seconds of something because that wasn't the first time there's also this <laughs> Scotty, shake something. Y'all remember that, right? What a great memory that was. <laughs> and that was that was like seemingly innocuous. It was only Michael, Sonny, and Prince, and myself, and a sound, a great sound engineer named Dave Natal, who um, is the Rolling Stone sound engineer, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine. And he's just a great guy, and he just crushed that mix. I mean, Dave... Dave was one of these couple of engineers that that paved the racetrack that I raced on for years. And then people would, you know, and I helped build that part of that racetrack, I'd like to say. And then other engineers after me sort of raced on that. But but uh, Dave, it was just Dave and Paris Patton who was shooting that uh, that video. Um, hmm. What a great night that was. But it, it didn't. I, it was one of those things where The Undertaker, it didn't seem like it was going to see the light of day. And it really kind of didn't. Um, yeah. I think it was available in his store on on lake street for like a minute and a half i think they had them had v copies there that you could buy and then it was gone suddenly it was just it had vanished and i only got a copy um from one of the band members back then it was uh but it's great to hear it in, in stereo like that i haven't i don't think i've ever heard it like that but i know you of course have a great <laughs> version of that well I, actually, I just i think i just picked up a i think i just i had like christmas i had christmas bells uh right like jingle bells and i had a <clears throat> a cowbell for honky tonk woman and i had a uh, a tambourine so i think i picked up the christmas bells and started to shake them i had a little microphone over there that prince had me so i was kind of unofficially a yoko ono of that band of the <laughs> of the power trio <laughs> hey, you gotta shake something right you gotta well, shake you know, something yeah we used to play when i when i was playing with my band we used to do a cover of honky tonk woman and it's mm. not a straightforward cowbell on that song oh, it's man, not no. like a clink clink it's like a dink 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 it's like it's a very yeah. distinct so were you able to match the pattern and everything or were you just I, kind of I did the best i could when i lost faith i would just kind of lean down and get away from the microphone because you're right it is a pattern that you sort of can't watch anyone you have to look down and just be thinking about that pattern it's a very stuttered type pattern that doesn't really match the song but it's 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 a beautiful part of the original song so i wanted to kind of kind of match that i don't know if you can hear it on the recording or not yeah well even in the beginning of the actual song by the rolling stones honky tonk women 
it the the way that that song starts out the drums and the way he comes in with this really bizarre fill that's kind of just it's just it's it's just unusual it's it's a really unusual song and it was really cool to hear him cover it for sure and uh yeah and you played on it that's awesome when when you get when you get a band together like the rolling stones and i'll say like another band that i really loved that I could never figure out their time. Some of their time is really weird is um, Van Halen. If you listen oh, to yeah. how how locked in Eddie and his brother cool. Alex as the drummer were, uh, especially on something as popular as Hot for Teacher, when you listen to that solo and how it ends, I don't I don't know if it ends on a three, on a one, on a, on a four and, you don't know where, but they just looked at each other live in the studio and then Eddie kind of nodded and they went back to the one. It was, and that's how Honky Tonk Woman is the same thing because it, it's got that crazy uh, cowbell pattern, and then it just sort of goes, bah, doom, boom, get, doom, get, doom, doom, and you go, I don't know, I guess there's the one. And yeah, how they that, figured each other out? That craziness with the, with the double kick pedals on that on Hot for Teacher is like, because it's supposed to sound like a motorcycle, I guess, and it's just yeah, like, yeah. wow, it's like, it's just so much going on in that album. And sure. that's some of the creativity that you just don't, I'm sorry to say, People don't find that it, it's it's a harder thing to find, isn't it? In mm -hmm. because it's so analog and it has to do with the relationship between two or th more people in a studio, and they just have to sort of find that. And now we go into the studio, and everything's laid out, everything's programmed, everything right. is is intentional. And I I remember hearing you at some point talk about having headphones in listening to Prince music is a different experience. That's such an adroit pickup by you. And it's such a great comment because you have to listen for all these deep things and you go, wait a minute, what was that? That's and right. you kind of go back and you go, well, that sounds like it's 20 feet away. And is that a woman or is it a, what is, is it a sound? Is it an animal? You don't know what it is. Prince had all sorts of, um, he, he did have all sorts of Easter eggs back in his music, yes, which is did. beautiful. And I would implore anybody, if you know, for those who don't know, we have the 24-7 Prince radio station that is ASCAP licensed, by the way, that if you listen to it throughout the day, because I will honestly, I have not, um, I have listened to all of his albums in headphones. I mean, because I've been listening to them for decades. So not every single album I ever listened to, I you know, gave the headphone treatment. I should have. But sometimes there will be a song that I've, I've heard for decades that will come on and I'll hear something. And I was like, wait, what was that? Right. It's, it's just like you rediscover all these little intricate yes. components that he would like just, just sprinkle in there. And you'd yeah. be surprised how many songs, even within the top 40 hits um, that you're just like, wow, there is like a lot going on there. And uh, what's crazier, which you guys probably can't relate to yet, but when I explain it, it'll make sense. Um, I've been doing music a long time as well. And, and I deal with engineering and, and all this stuff. I'm deaf in one ear. So now when you have headphones and you have things, there's stuff you don't, you don't catch. And I remember technology's changed so much, but back further back in the day, I was, you had your in-ears, you know, your old Walkman and things like that. And you hear music and you don't realize it. And then one day I put on the headphones backwards and I realized, wait, that's mm. not the same song. I'm I'm hearing things that I never heard before. And then, you know, and then you realize, oh, stereo mix brings stuff in. And but I have to consciously make sure that I check both sides or that I stereo mix it or I'm in my studio when I'm really wanting to hear something. Otherwise, I'll miss those little nuances. So it's a that's such a great pickup uh, as well by you, because um, you could hide things. And you could really use Prince did that masterfully. He used stereo masterfully, and especially because having having spoken with with some of the uh, engineers while I was engine studio engineers while I was live engineering, but then going back and talking to Susan Rogers, and we'd have discussions, and um, in her beautiful and gentle way that she explains things and that kind of unpacks them, um, she said that things were done so fast that you'd be amazed that the that the little um, clave sound on Let's Go Crazy is actually very stereo. And because all that was done so fast that um, Prince used to tell, or he, he would, he would told me that things were mistakes. He would say, mm, that was just a mistake. And he used to kind of, that used to be a sort of a boilerplate answer when I would ask him about a specific thing on a song that we were going to play live. Like, hey, do you want me to do this? 
And he'd say, well, that was a mistake. And I thought, wow, that's a pretty, pretty perfect mistake. You know, things were, were really, I, I have, I, I actually think that most things that he did were very intentional. There were very few mistakes. Right. He, he did say in an interview one time that if he ever made a mistake when he was doing a solo, like if he ever hit a bad note, he would just do it again so that you would believe that it was intentional that he did it. <laughs> right. So right. He would yeah. make an error and then he would go back and do it again. That's a uh, real thing. Yeah, but even yeah. when he was doing, uh, even just the the silly things that he would do, like if you if you ever listen to Freaks on This Side with uh, headphones on, it will go Freaks on This Side, then it will go Freaks on This Side, so it just switches from side to side, uh, so you can know what side the freaks are on. <laughs> well, he he would he would um he would want me to play with um with stereo panning of his guitar a lot um, live. Um, he would say, and then you can do your stereo thing. Like he would just say that. And when we'd be talking out a song and pacing it out and sort of rehearsing it by talking it through, he'd say, then when I do that, just make the, do your stereo thing on the guitar. Cause his guitar, when I was mixing was always mono. Um, mm -hmm. I never mixed him with a stereo rig. He had had a stereo rig in the past when he had, when he had Zeke Clark and he had other uh, technicians, but by and large, he had a mono signal. So he liked to explore that stereo panning and that I did manually. There's a, um, and you got the look. There's a breakdown uh, when they, it's a chorus breakdown. Um, do me chick, 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 chick. He would just go chick, 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 like that. And he wanted me to always do that just like right to left. Yeah. And he said, can you do it right to left? And I'm like, sure. Now that's not the, somebody who's being unintentional. Like he had a very specific aural vision, right? For what he wanted that to sound like. So I always, no matter where I was in mixing in the show, I had to grab the guitar pan or, you know, panning knob and go chick, 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 from right to left and then reset it again. Now, did he reenact? Like, do you think it was because it was that way on the recording and he wanted it to sound as close to the recording as possible, like reenacting that panning in the live? Oh, that's, it. that's a great question. Um, most of the time he left things up to me because he knew I knew the material pretty well um at least as well as the band and so i would more often than not i would come to him with questions do you want me to do this because it is already like this and then um he would either he either give me an answer or just not reference my question at all and um, move on to something else but i at least always had a, a list of questions I always had my notebook next to me and i would say do you want me to do this do you want me to do this um most of it was intentional though the the pop life vocal was the one that surprised me the most because if you listen to Pop Life, the vocal starts in the right speaker and the lead vocal, it's not in the center. It goes, what, what, Matt, Matt? You know, it's right, left, right, yeah. left, everything with it, your life, life. And so I, re I did that live just like the record. And boy, I got called right to his room after that show. And he was like, what are you doing on Pop Life? And I said, I'm doing the vocal the way it is on the record. He said, no, that was a mistake. Mm. So wow. of course it wasn't a mistake. It was, it wasn't <laughs> in the center. It was, it was all it's sort of all echo in a way. And so what I did is I, I put it back in the center and, and I believe this is on musicology as we, st or maybe, I don't know. I, it was either 2002 or 2004. And then slowly as we began to, to uh, go along in the tour, I started to m widen it out. I think I got it to about 10 o'clock and two o'clock just so that I gave the fans some sort of perspective Mm -hmm. of the real vocal how it sounded on the record because that's what you want to do my job is really to match what's on the record unless the artist says hey you know conceptually i'm thinking of this in a different way gaga was really good at that madonna was very poor at that some artists are very good at saying i want to feel this way or i want to this color to emerge and then i have to sort of turn those things into actual mixing moves yeah, that's exactly what i was going to ask you if how much of the record, like you use the record as your blueprint. How mm -hmm. often do you go, oh, what would really go good here? And then go to the artist and say, look, <laughs> we should do uh, that. Or do you he, not? he always, the only, that that's a good question. He The, the only time I would do that, um, and the only time Prince gave me full creative license uh, uh, verbally, like effects are your thing, Scotty. Like you do what you want. Um, so I would do things that I wanted to do. Otherwise I stuck by the book, you know, because you're also dealing with whenever he was playing legacy material, which, which I call legacy material, which are the hits and things like that. I want to kind of nail those so that the fans get, they absorb the most, they, 
they fans want to hear it how they hear it and how they know it. Um, the the one night alone tour, I got to do some really crazy stuff because it was jazz and I was involved in doing some cool things. And I was doing the um, what was it? It was it Avalon? No, no, no. Um, name family name. Family name had a super high vocal and then followed by a, a really low vocal. And I had to do those analog live and switch and make sure I got the voices. And I never screwed that up. That was, that's one that I actually had to work out choreography with my gear and how am I going to do, this is Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And uh, that was live. So that was fun and exciting and made me, Prince was really super gracious at allowing me to feel like I was part of the creative process and be that extra band member um, where uh, on, on musicology, the only time, because it was so many hits, I think it was um, uh, the, the Zeppelin tune, a whole lot of love. When, yeah. when we would do whole lot of love um, there's that triplet um, echo on Robert Plant's voice. Ooh, nay, nay. You know, and yeah. that was easy for me to do. I always had one set up on Prince ready to go, but the echo that would descended on his guitar where he would go, wow, wow, whoa, whoa, whoa. I just did that one night and without asking him. I made, the, I made the echo go down and it kept going down and Prince played into it and he understood what I was doing. So he trusted that and kept doing his whammy pedal. And that was, that was a little tense for me to do that, but that's sort of the bunkers in me. You know, I came up mixing at clubs in Minneapolis, really going for it. And that's what Prince always celebrated that in artists is really like sticking your neck out there and being on the edge of right on that edge of failure. You know, that's a razor's edge, but that's where he, especially at the after shows, that's where he um, survived in, in his mind was, was really laying it out there and doing something that could go wrong, but doesn't. And with him, it ne never did. Yeah. That same vocal effect. I think you used on the, um, that was the, on the opening of Prince piano on a microphone too, when he yes. would ever the city, he would always do that. And he, he specifically, when we talked through on January 20th, uh, sorry to cut you off. When we talked through on January 20th, uh, we had about three hours alone at, in, in the room at Paisley where we talked through like a football team would talk through a play, you know, and he said, I'm going to start like this. And do you have that effect you used on musicology? He specifically asked for it. And I said, sure. You know, the, the, the echo thing. And he's like, no, the, the one that goes down. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And fortunately I had a Yamaha console. I had that already called up and ready, you know, with Prince, I always had to have all my holsters sort of showing and the, 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 the big long Western jacket sort of already back around all the holsters. I had to have everything ready to go to right? because, <laughs> and I, and I did, I didn't have to kind of go, Oh, I think I can do that. I had it ready. And I said, yeah. And so I said this and he went, check one, two, check one, two, check one, two, check one, two. And he went and just kind of nodded. And so that's how we were going to start the show was with that echo effect. And then all he said was, um, when I start go playing Batman, then take that effect off, just leave it on until I start playing Batman. So think, even though he was talking, it was weird, right? He was going, and I was going, Oh no, like, should it be on right now? But we were live and it, the show was already going. But no, he was right. He started the Batman theme and I pulled the effect. So he was very intentional, super intentional. The guy was, um, there are not too many things that I saw him not think through. I think where you, you really took the cake with those kind of things is people don't always think about how music and what music really is. And when you listen to lyrics, you know that there's the verse and the real thing that pulls the song in is the hook, right? So you hear the hook, mm. the song, and you're like, oh, yeah, and everyone wants to sing that part. But what Prince was really beautiful at is making, finding the hooks in the music, not just the lyrical hook, but the musical hooks. Mm. And so, and he had a lot of them. So there were things that always came back and it was like made the song. So he was pulling those. Your skill was as an engineer, as the sound guy being prepared for the hooks. And, and I think yes. a lot miss that. They don't realize because as an audience member listening to the song, yeah, we love the vocals, but the musician in everybody, because people have that BS meter and that sound meter. When those, yeah. those repeated hooks come in musically, whatever effect it is, that's where we're blown away. And that's where you take it to the next level. So kudos for that kind of stuff. That you know? there's the, you know, when, when, 
there's an act, uh, there's an act. Um, when I mixed Earth, Wind and Fire, they had more like mini hooks in, within their music than any artist, more than Prince, more than anyone. They had little bass pulls and little um, little horn hits that were so part of what we think about when we listen to uh, September or, in, I mean, any, any of their hits that I was so busy um, making sure I got every bass lick and every guitar thing and every, and even going up to a band member, there's a, a great percussionist named David Whitworth and uh, Tigger is his nickname. And I said, Hey man, um, on this, on this song, they used to do a live version where they, where he, they go, Oh, oh, oh and he sings a part, you know, and I said, why don't you sing that part at, at this thing? He was like, cool. He listened back. He was like, Scotty, man, how do you remember that stuff? I, I don't know. And so they would be playing September. And when it got to this part, I would push David's vocal up and he'd go, whoa, whoa, whoa. And it just, it's because the fans know those little things. So I've always considered myself a fan with some, a modicum of control over the show and that I want to hear it. Like we all want to hear it. And so paying attention to those things and then being able to work with artists and musicians and not offend them by saying, Hey, I remember talking to Rhonda when we were doing DMSR and, uh, I said, Hey, in the intro, there's a doom, doom. There's like a, like a bass pull in the intro. It's like at the end of the intro and it's really an important sound. And she's like, she's like, what Scotty, what, let me, let me listen to this. And she listened and she was like, okay, I got that. Yeah, I'll do that. And from then on, whenever she played that, she would do that little bass lick that Prince did right before the verse. And she would look out at me and do that bass lick. So that's kind of a cool yeah. thing to know that we're as fans, we're waiting for those little things. We're waiting for those tiny little moments and Prince, uh, certain artists, certainly Prince, certainly Maurice White knew where to mine these little nuggets and drop them in, you know, like confetti in the middle of songs. And that that was so fun as an engineer for me to be able to explore and go seek those out and try and resolve those and make sure that they got to the fans. Yeah, you got, there's so many amazing. Um, there's so many amazing moments that I think, you know, you have to kind of get control of. Um and especially in the case of Earth, Wind, and Fire, when you have the, the more the more pieces that you have, the more um, and again going back to Earth, Wind, and Fire, there's so many horns and so many things that are happening all at once, and I imagine you know each one of them may have a little bit of a solo here or there, or you know some specific instruments have to be boosted, you know for this particular song as opposed to that particular song. I mean, is this just something that you just have to just have a, like a huge notebook of to go, you know, figure things out, or is it just kind of just some automated processes with limiters and compressors and things like that? I think, I think it it's um, most of it is just done via memory. Uh, I, I'll have to kind of go into the, my, my recording in my mind and just think about where these things are in every song and what, where, how I'm going to create that sonic signature that we're with which we are familiar as an audience. And then occasionally I'll go back and have to listen to a song and go, Oh, I didn't notice that before. And I really, the least favorite part of my job is studying the material, the way, um, in, in sort of a, in the manner of a student where I'm sort of charting and marking things. It takes right. kind of the fun out of it a little bit, but I mean, for example, I with Joe Lynn's show here, I mean, I've got, I've got all these notes that I'm now transferring um, that from last week's show that I'm now transferring to the to the programmer um, who does the program who does the playback for the show. Um, right. We call them playback engineers in the U.S. in in Asia they call them programmers. So um, that that person Prince never had one of those because he never used uh, tracks, uh, so to speak. Morris Hayes did a did a you know. Every keyboardist did some form of of, uh, of tracks for Prince, but it was all analog. It was all done without without click track, and um, but I have to make notes, and that's the least favorite part is like taking all my notes and one by one crossing them off and and sending them uh, in and like we need to do this and this and this and this and this. That's the least fun part of it. But I figure it's all a means to an end so that the fans' enjoyment is heightened. Well, I, I want to make sure that the, the folks know that I see your questions and I'm actually starring them mm -hmm. as I see them go by. So we're going to get to a lot of your questions. So 
I have, I'm not ignoring you. I do want to uh, say somebody wanted to say hello to you. That's in our chat room night right now. Mr. Kirk Johnson's in the house. Kirk J. No way. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on, big brother. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, yeah. So we always try to make sure that whenever he, whenever he makes a rare appearance that <laughs> always got to make sure that uh, What's, up? What's going on, Kirk? Um, yeah. So, We've got, um, and he says he's doing great. So I, I want to, we haven't even touched on the questions that I was planning on asking you tonight, uh, which is fantastic. This is great because there's so, there's so many different things that I don't want to, one of the things I didn't want to do tonight is I didn't want to replicate with, you know, some of the stories and things that we've mm. talked, talked about in other interviews so that people can actually learn more and kind of dig a little bit deeper. I one of the that, things yeah. I, I think was just, kind of glazed over in an interview that i saw but i didn't um you didn't really kind of expound on it at all and i want to remedy that and that is on this photo right here the photo that is is widely used in a lot of your appearances because why not this is a fantastic photo of you and prince at the board uh but one of the things i noticed is that that's a digital board and yes this is not a very digital guy he's more of an analog guy so um is this something um is this something that he was able to gravitate towards l later on or did he just kind of would just stay hands off or what was uh you know what, what was his vibe regarding regarding digital boards of, of all people to pop in and say hello kirk and i can kind of probably right now just smile and laugh about that because we would Kirk and I would talk about that, you know, like we Kirk and I live in a digital world. We're of the age that we all, all of us in uh, we three and Kirk and myself, we came up and everything was analog. And I had, I'm one of these engineers that started fully analog and now I'm fully digital. And Prince had, I'm going to postulate a theory. I think digital, I think he was a little bit afraid of it because he didn't understand it he he would claim that it would he would say i was wrong right now and he would say that it's just has to do with the sound and the reason i can the reason i can push back on that is because everything he released in the last however many years was all digital right there were sure you'd have you'd have record you'd, you'd release albums lps but um vinyl but it was all it, everything was digital and one particular um, I'm not speaking out of school here. He, he was giving me crap about having a digital console. And I said, yeah, man, but I just learned the song, fix your life up on the way here to Paisley park. And I said, there's no way I could have done that in an analog fashion. Like everything's digital now. And he was all about, as he said, about pushing electricity through a desk through a console, right. whether it be recording or live, he wanted to, as he said, push electricity through a desk. And he said, come on, Scotty, you know, you gotta, it's gotta be like muscle shoals and you gotta push electric. And I didn't even know what muscle shoals was at the time, but he would put, he said, you gotta push electricity through a desk. Mm -hmm. And I understand what he was trying to get. I understand what he was doing, but the, um, where we started in digital, even on that, that desk is Yamaha. That's a PM one D. So I imagine that is either that's probably, um, uh, 2002, I imagine, or 2004. Um, but, um, he, 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 he would fight me a little bit. And then when I wouldn't back off, um, uh, he just kind of let me do what I did. And I, speaking of Kirk, I got like tons of really great advice from Kirk just on how to, um, not how to get around on Prince, but just how to, my approach was really well laid out by Kirk. He's like, listen, man, that's you. I think Kirk is the one that said, that's your instrument. Like Kirk taught me like the meaning, the soundboard, that's my instrument. And when, and I took that to heart and then waited for the right moment. And when Prince, before the piano show, he was talking to me about using an analog desk. And I said, yeah, but I'm multi-tracking this for mixing later. I said, there's no way we can do this without doing it easy with one computer. And I said, hey, I would never tell you what guitar to play on what song. And that, and, and Prince considered that. I mean, he took enough time. There was a pregnant enough pause where he considered what I had just said. I said, I'd never tell you what guitar to play on what song. This is my instrument. 
And then he just like, let it go. And fortunately he did because for the piano show, then we had all that multi-tracked and someday I'm sure that'll come out or whatever. But, um, it is his love of analog was part that he really did like the sound and the warmth and part that he was afraid of faders flying by themselves and him not knowing where I tried to make the things really simple that he could walk up to the desk and see how they were labeled to this day. I still label things very simply and make sure that things are laid out so that I still, to this day, when I put bass guitar, I put B A S E. And that's a little ode to Prince because Prince said, everyone spells that wrong. It should be B A S E. And I was like, okay. And he's like, cause it's a foundation. And I was like, oh, okay. I never, I never thought of that. Like that's some Mitch Hedberg stuff, right? That's a different yeah. thing. So, yeah. so I, so I, to this day, when I write bass, I write B A S E. And if, and if people look at, at my desk and they see, it says B A S E and they think I can't spell it, that's fine. That's my little ode to Prince, you know, that, that, that that's a foundational instrument. So I leave things very simple and I tried to help accommodate his, uh, I won't say fear, his, his, um, his love of analog, I knew kind of where that from where that stemmed. So I was respectful of it, but I also took Kirk's advice and and treated that as my instrument. That's my instrument, and so um, I I played that instrument very well. Yeah, and, and you did. It was I I look over all the different things that you know you've done over over the years as far as you know when I I look to see reflecting back on the tours that I know that you worked on, and remembering the significant improvement in sound in just how the show sounded as far as being able to individually distinguish each one of the instruments instead of it really kind of all coming at you in just one yeah. day you know was uh i think the the one tour that i remember most distinctly and i think that a lot of prince fans would probably agree because i've seen i got an opportunity to see him like 27 times in concert but the one show the the one concert that i can remember that besides Prince Piano and Microphone, as far as full band was concerned, was that One Night Alone tour. That mm -hmm. the Rainbow Children tour, that I call it, obviously, mm -hmm. is the distinctiveness of just being able to hear everything so crystal clear. If you were a bass fan, you could hear Rhonda right out front. If you were a keyboard fan, Renato Neto was just, everything was crystal clear. It was just you could pick out everything. And I really enjoyed that because if there was a specific song that kind of lent itself to a specific instrument, it was really easy to engage yourself and really pay attention to everything that was going on and hear it all crystal clear. And it was really unusual because that was the first time I ever noticed that because all the mm. other shows were fantastic. Like, you know, uh, 99 was the first tour I ever saw, but I, I don't think they were at that point where, you know, there was a lot of things happening at that point, but it was just, it, it, was there something distinctive that was happening, you know, specifically with the One Night Alone tour that allowed it to, you know, to sound as clean, mm. I mean, just pristine as it did? The difference, I believe, in that tour was that the dynamic, the, the, um, the depth dynamic of how they played was greater on that tour than any tour I'd seen uh, before or since with Prince. So mm -hmm. meaning they had a, there was a jazz under, I mean, not even an undercurrent to that. That was, th there, that was a jazzy tour. And so there were a lot of ghost notes on the snare. There was a lot of depth. I didn't compress things a lot. That was, that was a, a one of the, the sec not secrets. That, that was one of the, the uh, audio signatures that I did on that tour is I kind of left things uncompressed and let the musicians use their playing. But there was a huge difference in note value between what Rhonda would play on a, on, on a song like Pop, Pop Life and then, or, or uh, uh, WNPG, what song was that? Tech, do, 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 bam, bam, uh, uh, you know. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. So, the 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 pop songs that he did play those were full force and those were had that wall of sound but then when they would do anything else i sort of let them sit back and be it have it be dynamic it certainly helped the size venues we were in strange relationship it was driving strange me crazy. relationship Sorry. Yeah. um <laughs> I was uh, <laughs> and, and uh 
so yeah. songs that were were more uh, full force, they they sounded good and and full, and then but they were able to pull back. So I didn't force the sound on that tour. Um, I'm actually really proud of that tour. There was a the the biggest what some would consider the biggest compliment of my career would be after a show in London, the owners of the sound company uh, that were there from eighth day sound, they were, we were at the sound board and some like old British dude walked up this old white dude. And he walked up and he said, uh, who mixed the show? And I was like, I did. And he said, um, he said, why? Well, he said, that was by far the best sound I've ever heard in my life. And I know a thing or two about sound. And as he, and and I was like, oh, thanks, man, I appreciate it. And as he started to walk away, one of the guys from the sound company said, oh, "Wait a minute, is your name Hugh?" And he said, "Yes, I'm. My name's Hugh Padham." What? And I was like, "Whatever." And then <laughs> Owen said, "Oh my God, such a pleasure to meet you." And he walked out. And Owen turned to me and he said, "Scotty, you will never receive a greater compliment in your career. That is Hugh Padham. That is like audio royalty." And I was like, "Oh, cool." And I didn't think anything of it. I looked him up later, and he's produced all these incredible you know, artists. And, um, when somebody like that can come in and you pass that litmus test, you know, that, that's a, that's a big deal. I was just, I was just happiest on that tour that, that it sounded so good for the fans because you want that energy, but Prince's fans were so good at listening. That's, um, we, we don't have that, those kind of audiences anymore. The, the, the Prince fans listened, they were listening for subtlety. They were listening for depth. They were listening. They weren't just singing along to everything. They wanted to hear Prince sing. So they would actually, you, I noticed that at, at Prince concerts, people would sing along less than they do at, say, a Journey concert or something. You go to a Journey concert, you can't even hear them singing because all the, the crowd singing. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, but Prince, they actually listened. So you had discerning fans with a, with a refined taste, and you had them actually listening to the artists. And I was able to sort of mix a lot of dynamic in that tour i was really proud of as opposed to say something like um the the hits or or um musicology or, or the, that kind of thing where you're pretty much putting the pedal down and you're you're sort of giving it to the fans pushing right. it right at them in that kind of scenario I'm, I'm curious how long would it take you because you know so many amazing venues you know places that you're doing these in how long would it take you to tune the room because mm. to get that Christmas, you have to spend time tuning to the room. You know what I mean? So on average, what was, what do you, what would it take? It would take me about an hour without the band. Uh, and, and most often times less, never really more than an hour. Um, okay. But the disadvantage I had back then is I had to do it either with my voice or I would play a CD. Um, right. But now we have virtual sound check. I can play back the exact show. Exactly. When I go into the, when I go into the stadium tomorrow, I'll be playing last week's show through the stadium mm -hmm. uh, system. So I can really refine it. But back then you had to, we had to know what we were looking for when we would just do two, one, two, and then sing a little bit through the mic and then get somebody to hit the kick drum, which would help. And then um, just play a CD, uh, one of Prince's CDs to sort of get, uh, uh, an overall tone. That's why I don't rely so heavily on system engineers because I think they mix by looking at a computer screen. Yep. They mix by looking at at pink noise and they look at 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 visual sonic uh, signatures. And I think it's much much better done with the human ear. You know, with with the actual medium that's going to be taking it in. I can do a much better job with my ear than I can um, just by looking at and say, no, it, it's supposed to sound good. Look, <laughs> like you go, no, no, it, you don't say it, it sounds good. Look. Um, that's, uh, that's not how it works. So I had a question for you because one of the things that I realized that you did, um, we're going to kind of change gears here because I actually do, I am like really itching to go jump to this one part where I'm, I'm going to hold off because I do have a four minute clip, um, of Susan Rogers when she was on the show and I want to share it, uh, because we're starting to get, as we start to get a little bit more technical when, when I had her on the show it was amazing. I mean, literally we could have talked to her forever. Uh, but there's a four minute clip that I want to play where she kind of reveals some, some settings and whatnot that, uh, were like her go-tos for her vocal for his vocal and guitar chain. So I was curious if there was any, I guess I'm going to go ahead and do it. I was just curious because we're going to take a little bit of a pause to listen to it. Uh, and then give, 
all you technical folks, all you sound geeks, an opportunity to kind of just geek out on this just for a second. All of us, yeah, all of us, <laughs> uh, just to kind of geek out just for a second on Susan Rogers. And then when we're done listening to it, cause I, I, it was like 10 minutes long and I put it down to four. Uh, I'm curious if any of that stuff still maintained itself when, when you were doing some mixing. So let's, let's take a quick, quick four minute break here listening to susan rogers when she came on the show and just to take a listen to this and uh tell me what you think i'll let you guys get out for a minute what were the regular vocal chain and regular guitar chains for prince's recordings that you worked on you got it um okay so the um mic preamps that prince liked were custom designed by a fellow named frank demidio prior to Prince working on that console, uh, a standard API mic preamp was the mic preamp that came closest to Frank Demidio. So an API mic preamp, um, that's, a, that's a nice discrete circuit preamp, the older ones anyway, and it's got a lot of gain. And then after you come out of the preamp, the Telefunken LA-2A limiter was fine for him because he knew how to ride the mic to get the, uh, the presence or the distance that he wanted. So those two things would give you enough gain to get to uh, the tape machine back in those days. Now, the tape machine, tape recording is different from digital recording. Analog recording, talk about a sonic signature, adds distortion byproducts. It adds harmonic distortion to the signal. So what comes out of the machine is different from what went in. And we liked it. We liked it. It boosted certain frequencies. It cut others. It was warm. It was rich. So we come back off the tape machine. And then uh, the reverb that he liked at Sunset Sound, we had an echo chamber. We could use the natural echo chamber. But uh, if you weren't at Sunset, if you were at Paisley or somewhere else, um, an EMT plate reverb was always nice. The Lexicon, uh, for those who are audio engineers, Lexicon made the great 480L and before that, it was the 240L. And for me, I always dialed up for him uh, a, a kind of a, a medium room. Uh, a large chamber was 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 okay if you added some pre-delay uh, onto that onto that patch. Yeah, kind of customize his reverb to get it warm and soft the way he liked it. But that was his vocal chain. Now the guitar chain. Let's take the, the number one recording guitar from the 80s for him was that Telecaster copy, the Honer guitar. Looks like a Telecaster. It's made by Honer. So you take that guitar and uh, he would always run it through. Um, well, he loved his, you, you, you know it well, I think, his Roland Boss effects pedals. Yeah. Those effects pedals were his secret ingredient. He needed that on his guitar, on his keyboards, certainly on the LM1 drum machine that he used. The output of that LM1 drum machine would run through this effects pedals with these Roland Boss foot pedals, and he could mix and match them. So he liked to have the flanger, the purple flanger. He had that. He used that a lot. And he liked the chorus, and he liked the um, heavy metal pedal that was yellow. There was a distortion one that was orange. He liked that. There was delays in there. And you, you could put, I think, six of them in the, uh, in the case, plus a little power supply. So you take your guitar, you run it through those effects pedals. You can bypass them if you don't want it. The output of that, I always used a Countryman direct box. I liked the Countryman on his guitar. Still love the Countryman to this day. I didn't want a transformer direct box because a transformer is going to add some distortion byproducts you didn't need for his guitar. I wanted a clean sound. So I would use the Countryman and again, feed it into the uh, tape machine. If it was going to be amplified, if his guitar was going to go through an amp and have distortion, it he always used the same guitar amp. It was a Mesa Boogie head and a bag end cabinet. And that was just his go-to. You mixing know, engineers need to stop and smoke a cigarette now, what I imagine. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. Oh, so that was a clip. <laughs> I can have another cigarette. <laughs> that was, I mean, when she was like dumping that information, you're just like, I... You know, I expected just like a regular 
I guess just like a little blanket answer, but she was like in it. Uh, did any of that stuff resonate with you as far as the consistency about some of the things that he did back then as opposed now, obviously this is a recording process as opposed to live. So there's, you know, there's, there's a little bit differences there, but does any of that resonate with you as far as some of the settings that he, that were his, his go-to? Uh, of course. Uh, and some of those things that I did with Prince, I would, I still do to this day on artists. Um, especially now Yamaha ha does a good job because they're such a musical company. Um, and I don't, I'm not paid by, by them or I don't endorse them more than just because I love the sound of them. Um, I've used them my whole career and, uh, even with their analog desks, but, um, all those things that of which Susan was speaking are pretty much available in the console now. So I use, instead of, uh, instead of the preamp that, that, uh, Susan mentioned, I use the Neve preamp. <clears throat> there are plenty of Neve products inside my console now. I use a knee preamp. I do use the 480L, the, the Lexicon reverbs. I use TC reverbs, TC electronics. I do a lot of the same, <clears throat> um, a lot of the same things that were analog gear before that I would use. Now I can use in the digital domain. And that's where some companies like Yamaha take such a musical approach to how they get those plugins to sound like the old gear. There, it, it's amazing. It's it's like you're plugging into the old gear without. Uh, without all the conditions of noise and noise floor being high and things like that. They're super clean, but they do sound like the real gear. So yeah, I've taken things that I've done on prints because I kind of came up mixing prints. That's, you know, that was early in my mixing career, relatively yeah. speaking, uh, 2000, when I started mixing prints in 2000. And so there are certain things I put in the chain. Now we don't have the luxury of having all those really expensive pieces and, and fragile pieces of, of analog gear on the road. So, uh, and when we do, they'd fall into different states of disrepair <clears throat> and which would then break the son sonic signature that we had going if things broke down. I remember, uh, even tie the H3000 harmonizers, uh, those things were, they were great, but they, they would go bad. They would just like sort of go bad. And so you'd have to have to have another one shipped in. So I was always a little bit nervous about analog, but now that we're in the digital domain and those things are so well replicated. Um, there, those, I still use an LA-2A on all my vocals because as Susan said, when you get an artist that has a really good microphone technique, you can lean into that compression just so beautifully. It's not harsh at all and get really good results that sound analog. If that's what we're all after anyway. Yeah, that's, it, it's just so cool. I, and I really wanted to kind of geek out just for a second for all mm -hmm. the sound engineers and the people that are in the house, because that's, you know, you are you know, the, some of the, as far as sound engineers, you're like an etch, you know, the, one of the top out there doing it right now. And so I think a lot of people like to understand, kind of get a little bit of an idea of how to up their game. And it's kind well, of it's, it's fun to be able to hear those pieces. The inter This is a good place to insert this. <clears throat> There's an overuse an over-reliance on plugins and gear that in the industry. Now, when you go to a show, and you go to Taylor Swift or you go to to a K-pop thing or you go see Dua Lipa. And I, and I listen to these artists when I go see them and I go, oh, and it's just crushed. Everything yeah. is crushed because the old adage is, uh, the old saying is just because you can doesn't mean you should. So right. because you can put in all these plugins in a chain, they worked for Susan. They worked in the studio. They worked because you had time to iron those things out. But when when we get to the point in the live setting where our chests are actually supposed to shake a little when the kick drum hits and we're supposed to kind of kind of get that air moving across us in a live setting, no matter where we are in the venue. And we start to put in all these things that we can and we start to compress everything. It just kind of sounds like a wall of sound. It doesn't, there's no depth there. And that's what younger and more inexperienced, I won't say younger, inexperienced engineers don't know how to keep the air moving in the room they take the air out of the room because they compress everything and it just sounds like a wall. Mm -hmm. So um, I can go see somebody like Journey and I know the engineer uh, by name, but I, I won't say it, but I saw Journey and I went, oh no, there's just, it was just a wall of sound. That's, that, that's what, more often than not, that's what you get nowadays. You get a wall of sound that kind of sounds good, but it kind of sounds like you can hear everything, but it all sounds together <clears throat> and there's not a lot of depth to it. And I think well, that's where, Prince always wanted to retain that depth. Right. In a well, is there like a difference between, I mean, how you would mix <clears throat> and 
uh, I mean, I, you have a specific mix that you do for a show, but it, do you have to mix a little bit differently when you're doing like say an outdoor amphitheater versus, you know, something that's inside is what, what are the differences that you, what are the adjustments that you make in the different types of venues like that? Yeah. It, now, so for the past, uh, since 2018, all I've done are stadiums. I don't think I've done any shows. I may have done a show with the fray in Virginia or something like one show in an outdoor amphitheater, but I've done all stadiums and it's a much different, <clears throat> the approach to the mix is exactly the same. What I feed into the PA is exactly the same. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's just that we have to, we have to make sure that, um, a full body sound travels 600 feet rather than just 200 feet. Right. Um, it's got to go the length of two football fields or a football field and a half. These stadiums in China are no joke. I mean, they're huge. The amount of speakers you use is just insane. And, um, I can get an efficiency in the way I mix where I don't need to do, I don't, you don't need to come there and look like you're looking up at the wizard of Oz palace with all these speakers. I can get it done with less speakers. Um, it's just knowing what I want to do, what I want to achieve in volume. And yeah, there is a difference in, even in artist to artist in Asia, they really want the singer. Uh, actually, Prince would rather enjoy how I'm mixing over here because they really want the singer on top. Um, they want that voice on top, almost inordinately on top, um, because that's where they they come to see is is Jolyn. They come to see her sing. So then I've got to kind of keep the band a little less dynamic. Also, the band is behind the stage for almost the whole show, so you're not seeing a visualization of the band up on the screen where you would want more depth and and movement in seeing a drummer do a drum fill and i turn it up at that point um you don't have that it's all just dancers and joe lynn the band is playing back there but then they only come out for one act uh, out of six and then they go back behind the screen so it's it's changed the, my approach and how i mix as well depending on the show and how what the show is like visually man that's just yeah, that's, that, that, that's a lot to take in i mean because there's just so much did you do the uh the oh, the one night alone in in the Tokyo show, yes. Because I remember we actually there was a clip of uh, I'd never heard him do Sign of the Times that way before. Matter of fact, he it was it was that weird kind of it was like a rocky lots of guitar feedback. Yeah, it was like and and everybody's dropping out and he's relying on Tokyo. Oh, it's like yeah. everything was just the way that he was vibing in that show. Even on the crappy bootleg recording that I had heard of that show, it was even fantastic on that recording just because you could hear everything the way that it was vibing with with the audience. It was just it was just the the ups were up and the downs were downs. And it was just it, you, it, you really did control the air. And it was really. Yeah, and, and, and so did he. I mean, Prince had a, he was a master of dynamic. He, he knew how to control, not only control the band, but he, um, that's just part of it. He knew what would work and he always knew what the audience reaction would be. And he would, when he would arrange something, he would say, and then we're going to wait, you know, four measures there. And I'm like, he said, cause the audience will be screaming right there. And then we're going to come in there. And like, so he already knew and plotted what the audience reaction would be. And he knew he, he would do what he had to do to make that happen the way he had envisioned it. So he yeah. was very, very, very good at understanding what people wanted and how to get them what they wanted. Yeah. And he, it, and so good that, at dynamics. Yeah. The dynamics of that show was pretty, I mean, he, he recreated it quite a bit, but yeah, the dynamics was pretty amazing, but mm. I want to switch gears for a second because I want to go back <laughs> in time for when, um, uh, for revolution, when the revolution decided yeah. to tour. And you were, I guess, from what I understand, um, tasked with getting all those loops and everything uh, together for them uh, to kind of cre recreate some of the sounds and recreate some of the pad work and stuff uh, for that Revolution tour. Um, I kind of want to ask what that experience was like to kind of be in the middle of of what was about to happen for them. Um, just just the process of collecting all of that it was like where do you start where do you you know uh i i just think this is compelling yeah th um because i had never worked with any of the revolution members before i think i had met wendy once at a sheila e thing years and years and years ago but otherwise i didn't know him i just had met wendy and maybe bobby once 
<clears throat> but Bobby and, and Matt called me, Bobby called me and said, Hey, we'd like to meet. And we met at uh, Rudolph's barbecue and we sat underneath the, the hostess sat us underneath the purple rain poster, which was sort of fitting. We all kind of laughed about that. And then we had about an hour discussion about what they wanted to do and what they thought was laying in front of them. And Bobby said, we haven't toured in 30 years. Like we don't know how to do this and we don't have a leader. And, um, uh, he was quite candid about that, uh, which I appreciated and said, okay, well I can help. I, I like know how to get you guys started. And so, um, we discussed bringing in, uh, playback because Bobby would, tr he would trigger all the loops, the one or two bar loops on his drum pad. And I said, okay, well, what if you're doing 1999 and you miss hitting that pad? He said, well, we'll just play through it and we'll pick it up on the next time. And I was like, oh my God, no, we, no, that's, we have to change the whole approach. So I brought in a playback engineer and, uh, a couple of weeks later, Bobby, um, and I met at Winterland Wonderland, some studio in Minneapolis. He rented a couple of hours and he brought his pad in and played me all the loops that he had. And, um, Bobby didn't have access, uh, the way that Kirk or Morris Hayes have access, had access during their day, their time to grab all these great sounds. So Bobby had a lot of old sounds. Um, they were the ones that were used on the tour, but some of them, in a lot of cases, they were, uh, de-interlaced. They were not stereo files. They were dual mono files. One would say mountains loop left. One would say mountains loop right. They hadn't been put together yet. There was a, it was sort of all over the place. And Bobby and I listened to some of these loops, and the 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 they were wrong. In some cases, they were just wrong. They were programmed wrong by the by the drum tech years and years ago. So it was a matter of taking those, and I'd listened to enough of them and enough different kick drums where I said, you know, it's just going to behoove us to just start over and just recreate these loops from scratch. Right. And fortunately, um, Matt had um, had uh, a contact named Christian Matthew Cullen, who's a really a genius um, uh, recording and, and performance engineer. And he is really good at recreating all the Lynn sounds and all the Prince sounds. He's amazing. And he I didn't know him. I hadn't met him. I still haven't met him in person. But um, Matt said, I think I can get you all the Lindrum sounds in one file. I said, great. So he sent me all the Lindrum files and I just had to tune the kick drums and the snares and the claps. I just had to redo them so that I had a full access to all the tunings of them. And then I just started from scratch. I think 1999 was the first loop that I had made. I was like, okay, it sounds like kick drum eight, you know, Lin kick one, number eight, tuning number eight. And I started there and I started to bring in snares and I started to add effects and I started to add in the, the Tom hits and all the things and where I kind of went, there it is, you know, there it is. That's the loop. And then I made that loop and handed it off to the playback engineer. And so I got not only levels correct and I had never done this in my career. Uh, I hadn't programmed loops for a show or anything. The closest we got was, uh, even right before Prince passed. I think Kirk tasked me with coming up with, um, Blanco, Blanco. <laughs> Bunku, uh, uh, <laughs> all the fans are going, Oh my God, how do you not know that song? But, um, so, so, uh, Kirk said, Hey man, can you make a loop out of this? He wants a loop of this. And I was like, Oh, I think so. I didn't have access to the vault at that point in, in where, whatever year that was. So I was like, I think so. So I took the song and I had to grab a beat here and a beat there and kind of move them around and edit it. And I got a loop out of it and I made a loop out of it out of about 20 different edits a clean loop without him singing or music over it. But that's the extent of my experience in making loops, making beats. So, uh, because that's just not, that's not my fort. That's not my area of expertise. Um, so, but I did it. I did it with the revolution stuff. I just said, what's your set list? <clears throat> and I built all the loops and I made them really hot the way Prince had want them, like right at the edge of distortion, you know, like really nice and, and fat. And then the beauty of it is that's when Mark, Brown Mark, kicked into gear and he said hey man scotty i can do some backgrounds and i said great and so i get i'd send him the loop or the bpms the beats per minute and then he would sing parts and then i got a hold of lisa and wendy and said hey can you sing your parts on mountain on this song and they said sure here's the beats it's a 121.5 beats per minute and they would do it and then i married mark and and the ladies parts together and it was perfect it was great so we essentially had some support background vocals, all the loops, 
and then very, very minimal keyboard parts are things that uh, Lisa and Matt couldn't do live at the exact same time. Signature, again, signature sounds that you don't want to miss from certain songs. You want those little bottle rocket synth and you want these little things to happen. So, and then I just recorded all the uh, intros to the songs. So I recorded myself saying the intro to the song in tempo. And so when they'd start a song, <laughs> too many, Kirk says too many hits. Uh, <laughs> and Kirk knows, Kirk, especially Kirk and Morris Hayes, they know the kind of row that is to hoe. I mean, you are working to try and, especially if it's not your own original thing, which you can do, you're, you're trying to match something, which is really difficult. And I'm very proud of the, um, of the, of the loops that I created. And, and Bobby said, Hey, you're never going to get them right. You'll never get them right. And I said, okay. So I did 1999. I, I texted it to Bobby. I said, listen in headphones. He listened. He wrote back. Okay. You nailed it. Keep going. So then I did mountains and then I did let's go crazy. And I just kept doing them and live. I think they really translate like the original songs. Yeah. And I know that wasn't, you know, there's some songs that obviously have really distinguished, um, you know, like, we already talked about pop life, you know, that dropout where it's got, you know, ding and it's got all the weird crowd yeah. noises and things. Um, Mountains is another good example because it's, yeah, it sounds so good. distant and reverby. It sounds really distant. I had to kind of create, recreate that as well. Yeah. Yeah. But then I, I thought that you also <clears throat> had done, you had previous experience with, uh, with that working with Michael Bland. Cause didn't you set up, set up triggers for him as well in, in um, i i was michael's i was michael's acoustic uh drum tech so there was another there was another guy named dave keffer way back in the day kirk will laugh at that name that's a name from the past dave was uh there was such an integrated electronics setup for michael that we had an electronics drum tech and michael being as powerful as he was he would break so many things so often i mean even in that photo you're showing look at that little to the left of center of that picture, that splash symbol, you see how it's already bent? It's already bent. Like that's, that. I mean, Michael would break so many things so much that um, that I would have to run up there like a, a pit stop on an F1 race and change out cymbals and change out kick pedal beaters. And, you know, I was so busy as an acoustic tech. And back then I was Kirk's acoustic drum tech as well. So I'd be running from side of the stage to the other side. And Kirk always made it fun. Um, we would laugh about stuff. I remember in particular, this is a sort of, a, I'm digressing here, but during the, um, during the get off, uh, on the MTV awards with his famous yellow outfit, um, that was, that was a recorded track, you know, that Prince was playing live guitar and singing to it, but it was part of, you know, you had to submit your thing to MTV. It was broadcast like that. Um, and I remember when the show was being played live, I was actually behind where Kirk was and Kirk has to, during get off go, you know, he he has to hit this signature little drum thing and he just kind of faked it and threw the sticks in the air and laughed at me and then ran back out to his place where he was. And we had a lot of fun. There was a lot of fun behind the scenes. And uh, I don't forget the, the people like Michael Bland, like Kirk Johnson, like Morris Hayes, um, that were so significant in my career at not only helping me understand the right way to do things, but to have to always have a positive to always be and have fun, be positive and have fun. And yeah. you can get through an artist who was candidly really difficult with whom to work because everything was on his terms. So um, Kirk and Michael and Morris, they taught me to have a great, good attitude and just keep working like Morris was his nose was always to the ground. Morris was always there before me and always there when I would leave. <clears throat> I don't let that happen anymore, partially because of Morris. I make sure I'm there before any musician. And when Joe Lynn or JJ Lynn or Lee Home or any artist gets to the stadium, I'm always behind my desk waiting because I have to be a little bit more of a soldier where they never have to wonder where's Scotty. Oh, he's right there. He's always at his desk, at his console, at his position. And uh, the, the, I learned principally, I learned those things from Morris, from Kirk, from Michael Bland about the attitude and and how to approach things and those things have served me to this day for sure joshua asked uh and said kirk what electronic percussion were you using and uh kirk answered uh samples rolling 760 and a rolling mm -hmm. ipad yeah, so there's your there's there was your answer <laughs> now you actually had access when you were um 
working on a variety of different things. And, and this this is just staggering to me that you had access to the vault. Um, and yes. you had pretty much unfettered access to the vault. And uh, this is kind of like a, a, a loaded question, but I was just so surprised with as protective as he was over the things that were in the vault, how many people had access to the vault that could just go in there, get things and make, you know, a, adjustments and, and just, you know, take things and utilize them for whatever. I mean, was there a book to sign out things? I mean, um, I don't remember ever signing anything. It, I, anytime I was ever in there was only when it was my capacity as a drum technician <clears throat> and not as a, a live engineer. Mm. I would go in there to get loops. As a matter of fact, I remember specifically the first time <clears throat> that I was in there and the most memorable was sign of the times because Prince said, Scotty, can you go on the vault and pull the loop from sign of the times? And I said, sure. So I grabbed Steve Kernel, one of the engineers that was there at the time said, Hey, he wants to go in the vault and get this. And we just walked in and he knew where sign of the times was. And we pulled the two inch. And I remember, I think that whole thing was on 24 tracks and they weren't even all used up if I remember right. But Prince remembered, he said, there's some sound that I had that's on channel 16. I'm almost positive. He said it was 16, 12 or 16. He said, don't forget to grab that sound. So when we spooled it up and, and put it on there I, and I listened to each, put up each fader, I said, yeah, I need that sound. What is that? Oh, that sounds like a conga. That's part of the loop. I'll take that. I need that. I need that. And then we sort of took everything. And then Steve said, it'd be easier if we just quick made a, a mix, a kind of a mix of the loop and just bounce it out stereo to you. I was like, great. So he just sort of got it up and referenced the real song, put it up, put a little effects on it, bounce that out to dat. And then I took that out. But the fact that it, it didn't have the lore behind it, the vault didn't as it does now. Right. Remember the vault, the vault didn't have that sort of, and this is in 92, 93, you know. 94. So, um, it, it didn't have that sort of reputation. Uh, Susan had just gotten done building that, that it's less of a vault and more of a room. I mean, it's yeah. not hermetically sealed. There, it was climate controlled. There was a dehumidifier in there. <clears throat> there was an old computer in there that, you know, things were, um, things were ragtag for a long time. I think it's when Dave Hampton came in and had the time with Prince away on tour where Dave, uh, who I recommended to Princeton came in and he, Dave's like, okay, I got it serious about like cataloging all of this stuff and barcoding everything. And that's when it, the ability, when, when I was there pulling stuff, pulling loops and sounds, it, it was sort of as it looks in the, in the photo there. Um, but mm -hmm. um, it, it's gone through various uh, states of, of able ability to find things in there, but it certainly did not have that reputation of uh, it, you couldn't just waltz in and out of there. Uh, you know, you had to be directed by Prince or Prince had to be able to say, and Kirk actually, and Morris would be able to speak a little bit better on this, but y y it wasn't just unfettered access. You, you, you had to have a reason to go in there and you didn't want to go in there unless you had to, there, there was nothing in there for me. And, and that was above my pay grade as far as being able to spool up a two inch machine and not hurt the damage, the tape too. So I didn't, Oh yeah, it wasn't in my purview. Right. That would be the biggest stress point, I would think, is just like, I am holding the originals of Sign of the Times in my hand. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, I don't think we thought I don't think we thought about it like that it, back in the day. Um, <laughs> it, it, and and besides that, you know, I've, I've, I'm probably repeating myself here, but at the end of the day, it really gets down to the fans enjoyment of the material. And and we all hold certain things like they're the this this uh golden you know st statue or something and this golden head that we can't and we we make things precious when they're really it just gets down to what song what is the song supposed to sound like how can we best utilize our time to get in there and make it sound good and what kind of lasting effect does it have for the people that are here to enjoy it yeah so I we didn't think too much about the preciousness of it we were we were all more in a, in a period of just trying to get things done. I remember in on musicology, Prince wanted to, he wanted to use the beginning when, when doves cry, he wanted it to be right off the record because, and Mike Scott was like, I can play that perfectly. Like you don't have a guitar in your hand. You're not playing it for this song. He's going to be dealing with the hat, flipping the hat around and doing stuff like that. And Mike was like, I can play it, you know, and he put on his octave and he was like, bah, 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 and Mike played it perfectly. Prince was like, Nope. I want it to be off the record. 
So we literally used a CD, took the beginning when doves cry, even the even the loop when the loop starts. So it does the guitar intro and it goes do ga ga do do back to and even that man and his wang and whatever and then on the one bow when it goes to that part that's when the live band kicked in now i hated it because i had to make it sound from a cd to a live band and that's a much more difficult transfer of sound than you get if we would have just spent the time done the work gone in the vault got the right sounds i could have maybe even called morris and or kirk and said hey do you have the sound to this and this and but it was done like with duct tape and spit, you know, and a book of matches and we got it done. But it wasn't what I wanted. But Prince didn't have the patience for it. So he just said, use a CD. And I was like, oh, my God. So we put a CD into the Roland pad and John just played the intro from the Roland pad, which is crazy to me. But it worked for Prince. Uh, all right. Let's get to some of these questions right here. Sure. Jeff, this is the fun part. I've never done a live show like this. <laughs> awesome. and, and we, Jeff and I were talking about this uh, off air last show that we did. I was like, one of the one of the things that we do with the show is that it is live with no net. Yeah, I mean, you have there's so many different things going on. Obviously, I do a bunch of prep work, and there's like you know lots of notes and things, and obviously we have you know photos of different things that I want to you know talk about. So there's a lot of prep work, but when we do this live, it's just there's like no room for mistakes. If you, if something fails, it, it it's happened a couple of times. I mean, it, it fails pretty. Yeah. It pretty never happens. That, <laughs> I'm used to being live. So this is great. Uh, all right. Let's get to some of these questions that are in here. Uh, Rodney's already asked this question a couple of times. I think yeah. he thinks I've missed it. Uh, Rodney yeah. says, did you ever get a chance to compare notes with Cubby Colby? You guys bumped into each other during the PRN alumni event. Yeah. No, uh, I, Rob and I didn't ever specifically talk about Prince or our approach or anything like that. Um, I certainly appreciate what Cubby has done, not only just, not only for Prince, but for the industry in general, Rob's a really important cornerstone engineer to live music because he mixed Prince. And then he went on to mix other artists. And again, you talk about, you know, running laps on a racetrack that somebody else built Rob um, is a super musical engineer. He's really a musical guy. So, um, he would do cool things like, um, put a delay, put an echo rather on Prince's voice on purple rain. And you're like, Matt might've come from Rob. Rob might've done that. It might've been Susan, but somebody came up with that. And then from then on, I, I always made sure I had that delay on Prince's, that echo on Prince's voice, things like that. Um, th it's important because what, what, what Cubby did was he, was um he was taking these super dynamic performances that had a very static lin drum sound right so that that kick drum is always going to be the same the snare is always going to sound the same the side stick the clap the, mm -hmm. the the cowbell all of that is very static in one volume and then you got prince and the band who are super dynamic and rob had you kind of in his own way the way i have in, in with other artists is to to make this marriage of a very technical aspect of the drum machine and a very dynamic aspect, which is the band. And I sort of, I grew up knowing how Prince sounded, uh, not only on record, but live. And so that was due to my sort of um, uh, cursory study of what Rob was doing live. And I had, and I had talked to them at a, at a couple of shows and, you know, you can tell by talking with them that he's a, a musical engineer and that's what prince demanded he demanded engineers especially at the front of house position that were really musical and and were actually like an extra band member so uh but as far as as far as talking about specifically about things we did with prince or or the differences and things like that not really but i certainly appreciate rob's uh part in prince's career it's a very it's a it's a just like roy bennett there are certain and susan there are certain people in prince's career that that help create a sonic signature both in the studio and live that that i had to follow and was sort of recreated their work in a sense yeah was the same thing i would say uh david coleman would probably be another another good example because yeah, yeah. i mean i i don't think that um what he did with prince as far as kind of getting him into that psychological that not psychological psychedelic uh yeah thing that he did with around the world in a day and you know kind of introducing things like sitars and just these weird uh really strange not oft used musical uh, 
equipment. It's just, he was really experimenting. He was like, well, what does this do? What does this do? Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of experimentation that was happening on around the world in the day. And I think that that is, you know, you got guys like David that is just like that. I don't, you know, I don't think that he, he probably was going in that direction, but there were so many different flavors and, and things that were created just like you said, by these you know external folks, um, was uh, which one they're here? Uh, da, 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 da. That's kind of an unusual one. Brian Lewis says, "In your time with him, did you ever see him feel intimidated musically by another musician?" No, no, I I, I didn't personally witness it myself. Um, he sort of, I always felt like he um, he once said to me at a um, at some show, he said. Uh, I don't care if they put me on at 2 p.m. Um, would you want to follow us? And I just had to laugh. I'm like, no. He didn't care if it was daylight and go on at 2 p.m. He didn't. The rest of the bands would have to have been compared to him the way they are with the Super Bowl performance. You know, every year that same thing comes up to the Super. Yeah, but it wasn't like Prince. You know, right. and so it's he, he didn't. I don't ever remember him being. Um, it, he he held people in high regard. He held Carlos and uh, Santana in high regard. Mm -hmm. um he had respect for um different um different musicians for different reasons but never intimidation i never i don't ever remember feeling that and maybe again kirk might know because he he had kirk had way more face time with with uh with prince and maybe they had spoken about it but i don't ever remember him even uh even alluding whatsoever to intimidation that just wasn't his uh his method yeah, I think I heard you mention in an interview one time that uh, I thought was an interesting thing that you said uh, to the effect that um, he liked to have people on stage that played a specific instrument better than him. Yeah. So you could kind of, you know, rely on their proficiency and professionalism so that he can kind of carry out, you know, uh, just make sure that it was going to be executed the way that he envisions. So, yeah. I, and it, it's, it, it, and better than better than him is that should have been in air quotes because sometimes you you might not be looked at as the best musician at a certain position, but you were the right musician for what Prince needed you for, which made right. you better than him in a sense. Um, you know, I there's a friend of mine who um, who was in the 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 orbit of of uh of prince and and that world and years years and years later it was probably 2017 2018 she asked me who was prince's greatest drummer and i said bobby z and she laughed and laughed and i said i said no skill level i mean you're you're talking about michael you're talking about blackwell you're talking about kirk like you can i can move through people will say sheila you could you could you could go through all sorts of answers for that but right. as far as like the drummer that most that had to do the exact thing they were hired to do standing up with electronics and an old lin machine and sort of integrate all this right. exactly how it was supposed to sound i'd like bobby had the most i put it this way bobby definitely had the hardest assignment right for sure. Mm -hmm. But does that make him the greatest skilled drummer? It doesn't mean he's, he and Michael are going to sit at guitar center and go, you know, trade fours and he's going to kick Michael's ass. It's not like that. It, it was all, it was always about understanding what your role was in what Prince wanted you to do. And some keyboard players had a better understanding of that than others. I, I mean, I could tell you my list. I probably shouldn't and wouldn't, but I could tell you my list of, of, you know which keyboard player nailed it which didn't of uh, what si background singers nail it which didn't which you know and prince i think prince brooked uh with patience um frustration over the years i had seen i'd watched bands and formations of bands that he had that i just went ooh, you know and i would listen to live shows and and uh, not not the mix i'm talking about just like the band and the command that that he had over the band and the the precision that he was trying to execute and it wasn't fully there. And I just would, I'd be like, Oh, it's just not like the right time. And that, mm -hmm. that ebbed and flowed in his career, but that didn't mean that he was just going to put, you know, the love sexy band or, or the, or the revolution back on stage or, or the NPG, you know, on, on back on stage, because you talk about that band when I was drum tech and when Michael and Kirk and, and Levi were there, Sonny, that was an incredible band, yeah. like super tight, like surgery. And, 
But that didn't mean that's what Prince wanted all the time. That's why I think he went to the well and chose drummers and keyboard players at different times that you thought, well, wait, once you have Michael Bland, why would you do anything else? Why would you do anything different? Well, it was because he wanted a different flavor. He wanted a different feel. And that he could get just by changing the roll call a little bit. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I, I was looking over, you know, obviously your body of work, and and I happened to uh, happen to find this little ditty. This oh yeah, the insert for one night alone, uh, the box set, which is uh, if you guys don't have it, it's pretty fantastic. Matter of fact, if any of you happen to go to Paisley Park, um, look closely because sometimes they have these down there. The entire box set you can get for like twenty bucks, which is crazy to me. I don't, you would think that they would you know, up the price in, in the middle of Paisley park, but you actually got like a full blown write up. Uh, I mean, it was yeah. pretty extensive. I mean, I had to break this apart to get all fit on the screen. Um, but what's really, really cool about this is that he had, there was a little bit of, uh, I guess input from all the members of the band, but did he come to you and say, Hey, I want you to write like, yeah, I mean, because he, he um it's like really uh, really short comments but you have like the most extensive in the entire booklet well he didn't give the instruction he gave lynn uh i think her name was anderson lynn anderson his his one of his assistants lynn called me and said um once i knew it was going to be a record once Prin prince called me into the studio one day uh lynn called and said he wants to see you out here i drove out to paisley park and I came in and, and she said, he's in studio. I just go in there. He's expecting you. And I walked in and he had a Jamba Juice. I remember that much. And he was listening to what I knew was the live mix right away. And it was really loud. He liked to listen to things really loud on those Westlake, on those Westlake monitors. And he, he was just cranked. And we kind of looked at each other, nodded up, and we sort of grooved for a while. And then he walked over to the CD player and he hit next. Like he had to hit next. And then it was the next song. So I knew it wasn't a DAT tape. So I knew already through my deductive reasoning that he, these things were being cataloged per song. So I knew something was up and we listened without a word. We listened to about four songs and then he turned it down and he said, I'm going to release this as a record. And I said, great. And, um, knowing I'd get that credit for that. And, um, it, it, it showed again, his fearlessness. I talk about it in that <clears throat> little essay I wrote. And, um, when it came time weeks later where he was going to start going to press with the, the, the insert Lynn called and said, he wants your comments. Uh, actually she said as a responsible part of the record, he wants your comments on how it was done. And I said, well, like what, like how I recorded it or, you know, cause it was just a left and right mix. There was no multi-tracking on that record at all. It was just what came out of the speakers is what you hear on the record. And, and she said, I don't know, you know him, he, he was cryptic. Like just, and I said, well, what are the, what are the band members writing? And she said, I don't know. Rhonda talked about her, her bass that she uh, endorses. And I was like, oh, and then I said, well, who cares what a sound man thinks? And she said, I don't know, just write what you want and get back to me. And I said, when does he want it? And she said, when do you think? So I uh, hung up That's and nice. I went in the basement and I went and I started to type and I would write a, a cool sentence that I thought was good. And I would move it down to the bottom of the word, you know, the document. And then I would. I started with that Ralph Waldo Emerson quote because just weeks before he was, we were, Prince and I were standing above the uh, atrium and he was going to go in and meet with Andre 3000 and some other guy in, and they were shooting pool. And Prince said, now I'm about to go in and talk to these guys. And, you know, he said, I'm always trying to teach them, you know, when I'm deal with talk with young artists and I'm trying to teach them about courage. And I said, oh, you know what Ralph Waldo Emerson says about courage? And I said, you know, about that that quote about courage, uh, uh, courage loves not uh, reality, conformity rather. Conformity loves not realities and creators, but names and customs, right? So you want to be non-conformist and you want to be courageous. And I said that quote to him. I, uh, I knew it by heart at the time. And he was like, yeah, that's cool. That's what I'm talking about. And he left and he went and talked and then I walked away. And so this was sort of fresh on my mind that we had had this discussion and I brought up that Emerson quote. So I started with the, the Ralph Waldo Emerson quote. And then I just sort of used that as inspiration. I just wrote about being a drum tech and then wrote about, I thought people would, fans would find it interesting about the after shows. So that's principally what I wrote about and how he was so courageous. We would show up at these after shows and just, just like, 
on no gear and just we just like rip out these two hour after shows till three four five in the morning and i would record them all on dat and just give them to prince or give them to a security guy and then he would go they would end up in the vault the paisley park and um uh, so when that became one whole record on the uh that album i was really excited about that that was that was the hardest part of that three disc set was the the after shows trying to get them all to sound they don't all sound exactly like because there's a several shows in there but i know la sounds a little different than you know seattle or whatever but um but writing about it was pretty easy once i got going and i'd never written anything in my life um i just would write sentences and i go i think that works and i kind of move things around i said i think this is good and i sent it to alan leeds i emailed alan and i said you want a grant you know i i sent him an email that started with hey you want a grammy for writing liner notes so i need your you, and he he wrote back right away within 20 minutes he was like with you know arrows and he was like where what do you mean here and unnecessary like he wrote the notes about like you're repeating yourself here and you don't need to and what is what to her and he wrote that and i went oh so i went in and kind of touched it up sent it to lynn that was the middle of the night and the next morning was one of the few times prince called me himself without a uh, pre-call you know um he i just picked up the phone and he said he said hey i i like what you wrote do you mind if we take out one sentence and i said uh what sentence is that and it was somewhere in there i wrote he believes in and belongs to himself and then he read that sentence and he said you know who i belong to and i was like right meaning Jehovah. So I said, right. Okay. I said, yeah, I think it still works without it. So he was, think about that. Prince was asking me my permission to change authorship of a document that I wrote about my experience with him. Like that's pretty powerful and not wow. many artists would be that, um, aware of that and be that respectful. I thought that was really telling of him. And then he said, do you mind if I send this to the band as an example of what to write? And I said, no, sure, of course. So he sent it to the whole band and then they had their quotes. And I think John listed his favorites. John or Renato listed their favorite all-time songs. Rhonda talked about her vector bass. You know, it was like whatever mine happened to be like this long-winded thing like I am on the show. Just like long-winded, but it's... And when Prince said, I'm going to put it right in the center of the book. And I was like, great, staple page. I'll be on the staple page. Like you can take it out and just... And he was wrong. It was like one or two off. Right. It wasn't the, quite the center, you know, but uh, that that's also perfectly Prince, like promising one thing and delivering just a little bit different than what you said. So I thought that was kind of cute in a way and like, sweet, but he said, but he was proud of it. And then when we played on The Tonight Show, and I'm always a consultant for those shows, right? So I go there and I sit in the booth and I say, hey, he's going to want Macy hotter. He's going to want that down and make sure you get the drums and, you know, whatever. And I did my consulting thing at The Tonight Show. Then we went to a place called Nardo's or no, some club in uh, Los Angeles. And we just went there to hang out after doing the tonight show. And Prince called me outside. And what I think is funny is that all these fans were waiting to get in behind this sort of lattice fence. And we were right there, like five feet from these fans. And they just couldn't see through the vines and through the fence that Prince and I were standing there. And <clears throat> Prince said, um, whether he'd had a glass of wine or two or not, I don't know. But he was really like beautifully affectionate in the way that he said it. He was like, Scotty, um, thank you for writing that essay. Um, and he said, uh, you're from Minneapolis. You understand. We understand. We're from Minneapolis. And which I don't know. I guess he was just trying to line up the, the mindset of a Minneapolitan, right? That, that he said, we get it. Um, and he said, I read, I read your essay. And I thought I got it. Then I read it again. And I said, no, he understands. And then I read it a third time. And that's when I knew, like, we're from Minneapolis. We get it. Which is really, like, a really lovely compliment. Because those did not fly out of Prince's mouth. And so I just took it for what it was. And I was like, cool, man. Yeah, I, I love it. Thanks for putting me in the book and whatever. And then I left. You know, we went back into this party and what whatever. And then uh, one day, Takumi, uh, shortly after that, came up. and said it i came back from lunch and he said hey he he left something on your console so i went up there and there it was like printed out with the you know when you print something out and you got the extra lines that go off the like it's it's ready for a printer or something right it's ex mm -hmm. extra lines and there were like pink and yellow and green and blue dots like for the color 
test and whatever. It was really nicely laid out like that. And on the bottom, it had it, the date that that was printed out was on my birthday, which I thought was kind of cool, even though prints didn't believe in birthdays, right? You, you had one birthday, but um, it was like nine, nine, uh, 2002 or whatever. So I thought that was great. And um, so I had it framed. It's at my house now. And I really, am, I'm super, I'm really proud of that because um, I'm only ever able to deal with information and, and things that are given to me. I reformulate them and, and hand them to the fans. But this was um, an allowance that Prince was giving me for all those years of service to have my own, um, I guess, uh, you know, my, my, my own entry into art, you know, it's like he, he treated that almost like a piece of art in the, in the book and put some beautiful artwork behind it. And, um, it was my own composition. It was my own small, super small way of contributing to, to that, that record, you know, that, that, uh, I didn't know was going to be made. I don't, I don't think I, my approach would have changed at all in the way I mix having known it was going to be a record. Um, but, uh, I'm super, that that's one of those crown jewels for me in my career is to be able to be a live engineer, but then for them to, for an artist to take my work and say, not only does this work in a giant venue, but it's going to work in an intimate headphones as well. And, and I'm really, really happy about that. That's a big, big deal to me. I'm really proud of that. So I am curious though, how did you get from, uh, Scotty Pakulski ah, to, right. to, to Scotty P to Scotty Baldwin? Uh, I think I well, no, no one wanted to, no one wanted to call me Scotty Pakulski. Um, as a matter of fact, someone years and years later, like only like five years ago, sent me a clip of a Los Angeles show where remember when we did a simulcast with all these theaters on musicology, it was yeah. right away. It was like one of the first shows and we were in LA and it got broadcast to all these theaters. Well, at the end, I think Prince said my name and I didn't know that. I don't remember it anyway, but he was like, yeah. And thanks, Mr. Paluski. <laughs> which was funny and i was like wait he didn't just say my name did he like and i re replayed it and i was like oh god he nobody called me scotty pakulski um sheila was the one who first started saying no you know i'm calling you scotty p you know and i was like oh okay cool so it, i had one of those cool you know it wasn't like the letter q or anything it was scotty p rolled off the tongue and she started that and then in the industry i kind of was known as scotty p anyway but i signed that with my full name uh, that's my birth name. And then when I got married in 2008 to my wife, Christina, um, she had, uh, I said, Hey, I don't mind taking your last name if you don't mind giving it to me. And she's, well, cause she came to me and said, do you mind if I keep my last name? She's an actress and opera singer and now artistic director. She had a name in the industry with her last name. And do you mind if I keep my last name? I said, no, actually, do you mind if I take your last name? I could be Scotty B you know, and that's what people know me around here as, uh, in Asia. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and in Minnesota, it's actually quite easy. You just, as you fill out the form to get married, it just says name before marriage, name after marriage. So I dropped the Michael. So I wasn't Scott, Michael Pakulski. I, I just was Scotty Baldwin. So, uh, it was quite easy to do. And, and nobody calls me Scotty Baldwin anyway. So, uh, it's when, you're filling out, when you're filling out forms, do you have to put a maiden name? <laughs> yeah, I do. It's it's knee. So it's like Scotty Baldwin knee Pakulski. Uh okay. so uh, wow. so I have to and when I do all the visa work when I, you know, cuz I'm traveling now and this year I'll be in Jakarta again in Tokyo and all these places where I'll need visas and I have to, you know, uh, other last name, former last name, things like that, I always have to put oh, Pakulski. Okay. It's even strange to write it anymore. All right. Wow. So I I I just I want to make sure that I get some of these questions in before before we sure, Yeah, I'd love it. Because there are, um, and I hope you're having a great time because it, this is awesome. I know a lot of people here are like just beside themselves because we got. Some yeah, this is really fun. I'll, I'll take as many questions as you want me to. <laughs> okay. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this guy or not. Maybe you are. Uh, but there is one of one of my favorite artists that I like listening to off to the side. Um, no people like, are you going to say The Fix? I'm like, no, I'm not going to say The Fix. I love that band, but I'm not going to say them. Uh, it's a guy that a lot of people don't know by the name of Bob Schneider. Now, I don't Bob, know Bob Schneider. Tell Bob me about Schneider him. is fantastic. Uh, he is one of these guys that's very much like Prince, plays all instruments, and writes this insane volume of material where he has to like create different bands. He's he's Bob Schneider, but he also has another band called uh, Ass Knockers, and he's, he's like a, a bunch of different. But he's 
very much like a, his his style changes all the time. The reason why I bring up Bob Schneider is because all of his live shows, whenever you go to see him in concert, the show that you just saw, as soon as the show is over, is immediately available for purchase after the show on CD. Yes. And so he there's somebody in the back that's recording the show. And then as soon as the show is over, you have to you have to sit and wait for 15 minutes or whatever. But then there will be a line of people who literally will go and stand in line for these CDs of the show they just saw. So it's like the best mm -hmm. way to kind of capture a memory. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, Eleanor says, like Pearl Jam. I don't remember Pearl Jam, Pearl Jam doing that, but uh, I, well, yeah, I know they did. Pearl they did. Stuff. Yeah, I know, but this is just very unusual to kind of see. And and the thing with the thing with Bob uh, is obviously is that his library is so insane. You have no idea what you're going to hear from from one show to the next. Very similar to Prince. Mm -hmm. Was every show as long as as far as you were involved? Was every show really kind of recorded? Um, recorded for you know the potential of possibly being being dropped at some point in time because I would imagine not just the vault material the unreleased songs that we know of but also the wealth of live shows that are sitting in that vault and the wealth of live shows that from we what we understand that every show is recorded every show is recorded hmm. um, do you know that to be true or was it like you know some were recorded a little bit more professionally than others or um every show that i mixed for prince was recorded to dat stereo output <clears throat> directly to dat mm -hmm. um digital audio tape for people that i mean it's already gone so i have to look at it as a as but it it, it was for archival purposes principally um and because i could um i in my recording rack especially on um in 2002, 2003, 2004, I had a really huge uh, 21 space rack and I had mini disc recorder. I had cassette recorder. I had a red book, a CD burner. Uh, um, I had um, a two DAT recorders because the show would go over two hours. So I needed to be able to overlap those DATs. So I had just a Y cable. Um, I had left and right coming out of my desk. Uh, the mix, same mix that was going to the, the uh, speakers left, right came out and those were Y cabled into two DAT recorders. And then either I or my assistant, um, would start the recording like maybe 20 minutes before the other one ended just to make sure we had enough overlap uh, on all these two plus hour shows. Cause each digital audio tape was only two hours. Um, so every show that I did was recorded either on CDR burned or better yet DAT anytime. And I had my own personal DAT recorder, a Sony that I would bring around just in case I needed to. <clears throat> and record shows on that. But I always would get the DAT recordings as soon as the show was over. I'd hand them to either Trevor or or Scotty March, whoever the um, uh, security of the day was. They would kind of swoop by my console and I'd give those up right away. And on the rare occasions that I had them in my possession and they would all take off before I could get them the DAT, I was always questioned about it the next day. Like Prince would say, did you make copies? I was like, no, of course not. As a matter of fact, They've been warm the whole time. They've been in my pocket, in my bunk on the bus. Like that's how protective I was of it. Mm -hmm. And he would be, um, on occasion, he would be like sort of uh, maniacally um, uh, uh, suspicious of that. But it was it was simply a, a a factor of time and energy. We'd get done with a show and then we would, an after show especially, and then I would just ride on the bus. And as soon as we got to that next city, I would either get in a cab or find a way to get myself to Trevor or Scotty and give them the... The recordings but yeah every show i did was always done always recorded on dat so all the musicology shows all the after shows all the one night alone live all the what, what was it called the hits 2000 2001 was it i think it was the hits maybe called the hits um whatever that tour was um all everything i did with prince mix wise was always even uh uh the piano and a microphone uh the gala event on january 21st 2016 was that was actually multi-tracked um and yeah. I know that wasn't from the actual show because the mic stand is coming from the wrong side. Uh, I would never put a mic stand in front of Prince like that. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it came from the other side. Um, <clears throat> but that was a promo thing that I think a girlfriend of Prince's took for him. But, um, um, but, uh, 
everything was uh the only things that we multi-tracked that i remember multi-tracking were obviously the piano show both of those piano shows the um the there was a show in auburn hills michigan in in detroit where um where we multi-tracked every uh, every uh uh channel on the desk uh that was a big pain because we had to call a truck in and get another splitter check all the lines it took all day to do that but those are the only shows that i remember multi-tracking at all and then the, of course the stuff on on um on the tonight show and things like that were all multi-tracked well and this this brings this brings the the next question regarding prince piano and a microphone um i was lucky enough i say this all the time people are like shut up i was lucky enough to be at both of those atlanta shows um mm. did you did you do the sound on those atlanta shows i i didn't i didn't yeah i left prince in new zealand after the auckland show i that's when i walked out uh so i I'd, I'd had enough we we was we were kind of disagreeing and we I thought, well, and I sent him a note that just said, basically, I think, I think that it's best for the show that I, that I leave. And, um, and I meant it. And, uh, Kirk was there. Kirk was like, don't do it, Scotty. Don't let him win. Don't let, don't leave. And I was like, nah, I'm not, not gonna, not gonna keep going. Cause he was, he was really relentless about that. But, um, and we were having great reviews and the sound was great and it was working. Um, and, uh, Kirk really on that tour, I have to say, I've, I've told Kirk to this, to in person but i'll say it for the record that he was very supportive and very of me kirk was and very and he really tried his best to sort of intervene and sort of uh get in the way of those like the flame that was coming at me and um uh so uh uh but uh so it, you know i just once you have a disagreement and i felt like i was on the bad end of of what was going on i decided well i'm working with you know with George, Quincy Jones, George Benton, Greg Philogenes. I had this thing going on in LA anyway, this live show and Gerald McCauley. So I thought, well, I'm just going to go back to that thinking that after he would get over it, that I'd be back and that I would, you know, like in six months, Kirk could call and say, Hey, let, you know, let's, we're going to do this thing. And it, I didn't think it'd be the last time, but, um, certainly I always was proud of myself that I stood up for my no meant no. And I sort of was like, no, I think you're being unreasonable. You're, you know, giving me a bunch of crap about stuff that's not there. And, um, and I think when you reach an impasse like that, and, and I'm a really accommodating and understanding person, I just felt like, well, for the benefit of the show, he doesn't have to feel like I'm behind him, like right behind him on stage. And, and, and I didn't want to, you know, freak him out at that point. So I thought, well, I'll just let somebody else give this a try. And, um, so I wasn't there for the Atlanta shows in, in hindsight, I would have loved to have seen that through. Of course. Um, I would have loved to have, gone finished and finished in perth and then flew back to wherever they started i think they started in oakland or somewhere and then done all those shows i would have loved to have done that that would have been mm. the right thing to do for me but it just wasn't to be and i don't have regret about that and i certainly don't regret standing up for myself um and just saying no you know like not not everyone has to bend to the whim of somebody who seems like they're on the wrong side of the world as far as time difference and attitude so that's because that's a little bit unusual because you know when he's He's literally calling you out specifically in this in the Paisley Park show uh, on the mm -hmm. debut of this tour about how fantastic the sound is, and he's bragging about you on mic to kind of go from oh, this is utter perfection to you know whatever occurred on the on, on the tour that you walked out. Obviously, there was there was some type of type of disparity there, but um, I don't think it helped that Denise died right when we got over there that vanity passed away basically on one of the first shows, the, the show that he had me delete the only show that he like came over right after the show, walked off stage, walked up to my laptop and me and said, delete that show. And I deleted it. And then he said, all right, now delete your trash or empty your trash. And you know, we all know that Mac and that MacBook trash sound. Right. And I deleted it. I was like, there you go. And he walked off. So I think that that show, that that he did after she he had found out she passed was the only show that was fully deleted other than that when i left everything went to kirk and went to the vault and, and the lawyers and such so it's um that that was i think that was an emotional trip for him i think that he um that he had a time difference issue i can't really even say what it was whatever it was it was um i was the only uh target if you will of any sort of ire that he was feeling right when he had a band he could always blame john 
Blackwell. You know, John was sort of the guy he always went after. And he always had a, a sort of a person in the band that he could go after and make fun of in a way. And uh, I always thought John was very sweet about the way he handled that. He let it just roll off his back and he would just kind of laugh. And John was such a sweet guy. And, um, and I became the only available target. Um, Kirk was smart enough to sort of, <laughs> to sort of just stay out of the way. And, um, but he was really supportive in trying to get us past that. Cause, uh, uh, but he was feeling, in, he was in a certain way in, in, in Australia. So we'll keep it a little bit, we'll keep it positive for, for right now, but cause sure. are, are you aware of the, we know that the Paisley Park one was recorded, and and let me take this down because I want to show you this. Uh, obviously, this has not been that Paisley Park show has not been officially released, right? But at some point in time, um, obviously, I don't know if you saw it, but however they got a hold of it, got a hold of those recordings, and it was put together in this box set. And I'm not exactly sure if you've even ever wow. seen this box set. No, I, I, box, I was I'm completely cool unaware. Box full-blown box set that I guess these people, it, this was sent to me that is got all the Paisley park stuff from the Prince piano on a microphone. Uh, and it was put together and somebody sent it to me. And, uh, I guess it was done by that bootleg company. Uh, oh. I records or whatever their name was. The ones that are, are the estate is, you know, fighting against right now or okay. not. They want it, I guess. My concern is, uh, obviously, somebody sent it to me, and I was just like, well, I'm going to see this. I want to see this for sure. <laughs> I'm certainly going to listen to it for sure. Um, but what was interesting to me is that, do you think, or have you even been contacted because of the fact that you were involved in the recording of that Paisley Park show, or even the Atlanta show. I don't even know that the Atlanta show was was ever really recorded. There certainly was no video. I know there's video of the Paisley Park show, but there's no video of Atlanta. Because with me being at both, especially I was fifth row for the first show, there was no cameras anywhere. Mm -hmm. So normally if you're going to get like a camera, you, you could normally see them floating around or in specific positions and whatnot. Uh I, I'm curious if those Atlanta shows, I know there's bootlegs of it, but I, I'm curious if those Atlanta shows will ever see the light of day or if the the actual physical product from the estate ordained from the estate will ever see the light of day. Um, have you been contacted at all by the estate as to whether, you know, I, I would assume that they're going to reach out to the people that were involved in the recording of that. Yeah. If, if the, Jan 21, 2016 show, the, the gala, it, um, it, the Paisley park show, if that's released, I'm sure that they're going to contact Kirk, myself, um, John gas, uh, who's the engineer who took my multi-tracks and, uh, we went right in the studio after show one, uh, we went right in the studio and dumped it into pro tools and John started mixing it right away. Um, by the end of show two, Prince was going in and proofing the mixes from from show one. It was incredible. Um, that's how fast things flew. Um, no, no one has contacted me from the estate. I'm sure they'll get around to it. I'm certainly willing to help. Um, because there are only so many people that can help tell that story. Um, I think it's important to be accurate as to how everything went down. Um, I know that specifically Kirk really worked his butt off in the days up to making that show happen. Um, there was so much to do and, and so little time. And when he wanted it to happen and does he come in on a ramp? Does he come in on stairs? Does, do we, do we light him from behind? Yeah. I want yellow light from behind. And <clears throat> we had to make all these things happen. And Kirk again, uh, had to work overtime to get like smoke machines and the doors to open. And <clears throat> so I'm running smoke machines and two stagehands are opening the doors and the light is turned on and he walks up from, you know, it all looks like magic, but it was all done really, um, uh, as a stroke of Kirk's, you know, uh, uh, mm. industriousness and ability to get it done. I had the mix part of it down easy. That was, um, Prince wanted it in, in quad sound, um, which is essentially 4.0 sound or 4.1 in this case. So he wanted speakers on all four corners and he wanted speakers in front of the stage. And we found a formation that worked, 
um, that Kirk would check with me and I was like, yeah, that'll work. You know, we'll just lay the speakers down. And most of the sound came from around the stage, but then I added in sound and effects from, from behind. So it was really quite, uh, quite a cool sounding show. Um, I even mic'd his foot so that when he stomped, you know, you could hear that as a percussive, uh, effect and that that was multi-tracked as well so they had that but i don't know when that will come out or if um i wish i had more interest in it uh at this point but when it does come out they they can feel free to reach out because i have you know so many things to to say about it and so many photographs that i took of my actual setup and my perspective of where i was mixing and things like that so it was a special show i had nothing to do with atlanta i don't even know if that was uh you know, recorded uh, a, a stereo recording of it because I didn't know the engineer and I don't know the system person and I, I don't know anything about that. Once I left, I really kind of left. Uh, and um, uh, but but he certainly that was a very personal show, the, the January 21st show. Um, I don't think anybody knew. I certainly even talking with him alone for three hours the night before, I didn't know it would have, have an autobiographical nature to it. He didn't say it was going to be autobiographical. He just said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to play the Batman theme. I'm going to do this, da, da, da. And I said, okay, on something in the water does not compute. Do you want that echo on your voice? He's like, yeah, do whatever you want, you know, do your thing. And, and, I, and then we talked about like, um, uh, sometimes it snows in April, which ends up being a, a really song with a lot of gravity at this point right at that performance and where he snaps as the drum beat he snaps and i and when he was rehearsing it i said oh wait hold up man can you do that again i have an effect for you and so he played it and he went like this and i added this like stereo effect this 5.1 stereo effect on um or this uh, uh stereo effect in within the uh, the halls of paisley park the uh, in all four corners is really kind of cool if you were in the room for that so we sort of worked on what we were going to do and that is part of the story that needs to be told as well like those things but i'm certainly willing to help the estate um tell the story of that very special show that hopefully will be released at some point uh, kirk will have a lot to say i'll have a lot to say and um and it's really special it'll be special in understanding that artist yeah, I, I think it's interesting that, you know, I don't think there's any, your video is frozen, but we can hear you fine audio, but this is, which, which is fine. Um, okay. One of the things that um, we, I guess we're going to have to accept as fans is that I don't believe that the Atlanta, I, I shouldn't say the Atlanta show was recorded, just like you were saying, like almost every show was recorded, but that it was not done in the level of quality or the level of detail that the Paisley park one was, I mean, obviously you have a lot more resources in his house, you know? Yeah. Uh, but so I think if Prince piano on a microphone does see the light of day, it's only going to be the one that's it was going to, it's going to be that one at, at, yeah. at, at Paisley park mm. before, before Agreed. the last one, um, which is, I, I think a lot of people want to hear, they want to hear his last show. You know, I, I, I there's that, last show you know the, the right. last show um and i just um and speaking of which last show even during that period of time i know you said there was a lot of emotional things that were going on um with after vanity's passing um was it ever evident was it evident to you at all um that there was anything going on with him health-wise no um a hundred, a hundred percent. No. Can you still hear me by the way? Yeah, I can still hear you. Perfectly fine. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Now you just came back. I lost you on the screen here. Um, I'm behind the great firewall of China. So it's, it's, I think the fact that we're even doing this is pretty miraculous, but, um, uh, no, I had no indication whatsoever. There was no, um, you know, he kept to himself all the time anyway. And in, in these kind of situations, it's easy in retrospect. I remember seeing a photo of him from, oh, I don't know, somewhere in Australia. And after he had passed and I saw the photo and I was like, whoa, like, there's no way like that's been doctored or something. And because he just didn't look fit, but I never, I didn't really notice that I saw him enough on a daily basis, especially from when Kirk called me in November of 2015, I was back there on a regular daily basis, almost at Paisley park. So it was a very natural progression. I didn't see any sort of, um, deleterious effect happening to him or anything like that. So, uh, you know, it's easy for other people to see that, but um, I, 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 I tend to think of myself as a pretty observant person, but I didn't have any indication. Uh, and I would tell you if I did, um, but that, that he was going through anything. 
Yeah. All right. Last couple of questions because I got a feeling if we're losing video, we might lose audio on you. So I got just just two more questions so that we can make sure that we uh, I, I get these in too. In your sure. opinion, in your own opinion, uh, what do you feel so far has been the best posthumous remastering of the of of what you've seen so far between the Inside the Times and 1999 and whatever else? In complete candor, I have not kept up with all the goings on that the, that has been going on with the releases and things like that. I did see a box set of 1999, which uh, I, if I remember right, was it or vinyl and it was a different color or it was, was it silver or white or something like that? It was like a different color than the, than the, and I looked at the track listing on there and I thought that was beautiful, like incredible to see those amount of tracks come out of that time. And I think that for people that want to take in all the material that Prince had to offer, um, that was a very, that track list anyway, was special because there were a lot of super deep cuts, things that I don't even think people knew existed. Yeah. Um, Agreed. So I think that was, so that, and that was a really important time in his career too, because it was pre Purple Rain and he was really finding his sound and really exploring the Lynn LM1 drum computer. And he was, um, really at the zenith i think of his creative powers were around 1999 and and purple rain for me anyway yeah well what about uh, you what do you think i i think all of them are fantastic i really honestly am not looking forward i mean i guess i kind of am the the 40th anniversary of purple rain is coming up but we we've already had like four three or four different revisions posthumously since he's passed so it's like okay what what else are we going to happen here because i think they really kind of went into the they went deep into the vault to kind of get tracks that were recorded around that time period. And some of which kind of, you know, didn't even fall onto albums that, you know, were, were even past that time area. It was like, the, the, I would probably say sign of the times is probably one of the best just because of, uh, obviously the quality of that album, how fantastic that album is out of the gate, but it also yeah. had like a ton of, of unreleased tracks on it that were really, really good, high quality, high quality tracks. But I will agree that the amount of tracks that were on 1999 and some of those songs, just like you said, we didn't even know even existed. Were pretty much just woof. Right. It was just it was it was pretty amazing. But I am looking forward to seeing. Uh, I've heard rumblings of a release of a box set for Parade. Um, that's mm. that's been. I mean, that has been rumored for a very very long time uh but i've actually seen somebody and it maybe was probably doctored or whatever but i did see something on twitter where somebody had actually shown uh an actual box that actually had listings of what was actually on it mm -hmm. um so it's going to be pretty interesting to see if that sees the light of day but i know the main challenge with that one is the movie that's tied to it uh because it under the cherry moon has changed hands ownership wise multiple mm -hmm. times and so it's getting all the licensing agreements and stuff together and getting it finalized and figured out is is really the biggest issue um but it's something it's something that prince himself was able to cut through all that red tape you know when he would just right. do what he wanted to do and because you've got you know uh there's no captain of the ship you have to deal with multiple parties and you have to deal with the legality issues and yeah. and and he couldn't just walk into a boardroom of lawyers in the, on their turf and intimidate them which he was an imposing person to be in the room um however you know i somebody once said well how who worked with prince a lot and i other than kirk i'm sure i i I count over a 26 year period, I was involved in 16 years in one form or another. That's a long time to be around someone. Yep. And I never lost that frosty feeling um, of not, I would say it's not nervousness. It was always just a frosty. I was, I felt frosty when he was around. I was always ready. And I, and I was always, um, uh, cause he was always ready. He was always ready to either perform or, and he was always on, so to speak. And he was, uh, you always, I was never back on my heels. Um, and I missed that. And I saw somebody in the, in the, I just glanced over at the, at the comments and somebody said, Scotty, do you miss him? And, um, I do miss him. I miss him now more than I did the first couple of years that he was gone. Uh, I miss working with Kirk. I miss working at Paisley park in that place. 
I miss the level of attention to detail and what was expected of me. I miss that. And certainly Prince had that in me. Um, I miss um, uh, the jokes. I miss the, I try and apply what I worked on or the um, level of excellence that I have, that I had to have back then to survive there. I try and em employ it on every show I'm on now. And it's much appreciated out here. And I have a really good reputation, especially in Asia now. I mean, I'm like the hot engineer over here and I'm doing all the biggest oh. artists one after the other. And that is, that comes directly from my work with Prince and that level of attention to detail and that level of expectation in oneself of oneself. And that just wouldn't have existed had I not uh, been around that guy and the people that he had surround him too. And I mean, everybody from the other drum techs when I was mixing to the other technicians when I was drum teching to the Kirks and the Morrises and the people who all had a hand in feeling like we were part of this really powerful team that we were greater than the sum of our parts. It, I do miss that feeling. I get the closest thing I do get to it is actually over here in Asia because everything over here is so based on team, team dynamics. We're all part of a team. I'm um, team Jolin, you know, um, uh, everything is, is team based here. And in the West, we tend to be like all individuals that come together. You know, it's a little bit different. I work really well within the team environment, even though I'm kind of the hot shot person over here on on these tours like uh, the en hotshot engineer from the west i still keep the mentality of being part of a team that's never left me and i owe and i attribute that all to how i felt not only as a drum tech um but as an engineer and as someone trusted in a position of working with someone's art and having it all go through my two ears and my you know right <laughs> index finger and pushing it up into into a pa that's a lot of trust that an artist has in someone yeah. and um and that, and I appreciate that more in Prince than ever. And I miss that. I miss having that trust like that. Yeah. I'm, and, and for those who don't know, yes, Scotty is in China right now. Um, and before you go, what are you doing over there? Who, who are you doing mixing for right now again? Um, her name is Jolin Tsai, uh, J-O-L-I-N. And her last name is T-S-A-I. And if you think about the population of China, they're, they're knocking on a 2 billion people. Um, when you take an artist like Joe Lin, who no one in the West has heard of, none of your listeners have heard of, I, I, um, unless they're like, you know, Chinese students in the US or something, and, and then they would know every artist with whom I'm working with over here. But um, Joe Lin is maybe, say, the popularity of take, I don't know, Katy Perry, Beyonce, someone of that kind of level, and then times three. So that's how popular Joe Lin is. And almost all the artists over here, um, JJ Lin, same thing. When I when I leave Joe Lin, I go back to JJ Lin uh, in late this year and in, in, in 2025. JJ is probably arguably as popular, if not more, than Joe Lin. So you you've got these massively popular artists uh like that are on a triple scale, like uh like laundry detergent that's like three times more powerful. You only have to use a little. That's what it's like over here. The artists are so popular that all the shows are in stadiums. They're, they don't do shows. So they'll do two and three nights in stadiums over here. So it's really, um, uh, it's a, a lot of people that we can affect in a really good way. And um, and the Asian fans are so lovely. And, and I found my home. You know, I would like to finish out my career here in Asia, working in tai Taiwan and 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 China, because I feel like I'm I've graduated up to this level. And the musicians over here, you guys are just, oh yeah, it's it's scary, um, because you think once you've mixed Pino Palladino on bass or Dennis Chambers or Michael Bland on drums or you know you mix these artists, you go, man, that's it, that's the they're the best. And then you come over here and you find out that 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 is the that's the the norm not the exception because most of the musicians over here whether they live in china or especially in taiwan especially in taiwan and singapore those musicians uh they come over to the us they all get degrees from berkeley and and then come back and they have the sight reading down they have the technical aspects down they have the tunings down they have the um they they really Everything is, I mean, JoLynn in her show now, we're up to over 220 songs available in her show. Does that sound familiar? Like, oh, yeah. you know, where Prince could just, at an after show, could just call out any any song. Well, JoLynn's got, in her ballad section, has uh, 221 ballad songs that she can call out at any time. Oh, my God. And she'll just say off mic, she'll say 46. 
And then the, all the musicians have to go to their iPads and play that song with no rehearsal and do, you know, a 10 or 12 ballad medley uh, just called out like an audible. So that part of it um, reminds me of Prince and, and that, that uh, the honor that I have to present some artists really hard work to their fans is a, is a big deal to me. Something, yeah. I, I mean, I take it super seriously. I mean, it's amazing because those fans over in Asia are, are, are really hardcore. We interviewed uh, a funk band out of Japan called Endra Carey, uh, and they are Kiri. Uh, Endra Kiri. It's E N D R E C H E R I. So I always said Endra Sherry, and then it's Kiri Kiri. Uh, but they, <laughs> but they are like really, they're like a really cool. It's it's one guy, um, funk. and and he is they're they're a funk band but he didn't start out that way, but I didn't realize the size of them, but they're like, uh, his band, uh, Suyoshi Demoto is his name. He is like Bruno Mars over there in Japan. Yeah. And when I interviewed him, uh, we didn't interview him live because there was the, we, we didn't have, um, uh, we had a translator. We, we did. It was, it was a weird interview, but it was all printed. Yeah. But when we posted the interview on the site, it crashed our servers like twice. Broke us. Uh, and it was just like, okay, you just don't, you can't get the scope of how huge these bands are over there until, you know, it, it was, it was like being attacked it's, by the guys. It's really phenomenal. There's a uh, great artist named David Tao, T-A-O. And David is a huge success and he's around my age. He's in his fifties. And David um, was born, I think, unless I'm wrong, he was either born or trans, uh, or moved to Los Angeles. As a matter of fact, I think David was like a CHP officer for a couple of years. And, and then he went back to Taipei, became a huge phenomenon. And David Tao is credited with single-handedly with bringing an R and B like mid early mid nineties sound, all that take six kind of harmonies and dissonance and flats right. and blues stuff. David brought that to Chinese music. So he, uh, everything for a long time, everything, even in the pop music existed in the pentatonic, right. And then David was the one who was kind of credited and right. So David as an artist sort of did these flats and these sharps and these blues notes and sort of chords. Um, and and he became this wild success. And David had me come over and mix a show. I think it was last year, this special show that he did called bring in the light or bring the light in something like that. And so he wanted me. So I came over and rehearsed in Taiwan and had this all-star band and of a you know British drummer named Ash Sohn and uh, Jamie on guitar and uh, uh, the, all these really, Paul, Paul Bushnell on bass, like these really world-class musicians, Ken Long on piano. And um, so we did this show. And then David said, oh, you, by the way, and this is like three hours before the show, he said, you have a press conference. And I said, oh, for what do you mean? And he said, well, there's like a bunch of cameras waiting for you. I just want you to speak. You'll know what to say. And then I got basically like shoved into this hallway and there were all these uh, cameras there. And I did this sort of interview and the guy would ask me a question and the translator would tell me and I would say the answer. And at some point I said, um, you know, just knowing how to kind of bring it home. I was talking about the end of this pandemic and that we all need to get back to art and art tells us a story of what we've gone through in the world and, and shining a light on things. And that's what David is doing is bringing the light in. And like I mentioned the title or whatever, and I got done and the interview said, thank you so much. You know, Shisha Zhang Jin and, and got done. And then I noticed this camera man was crying. Like he, he was so affected by that that like that's how serious they take their artistry over here is this camera person came up and shook my hand and he was crying and through the translator he said that your words were powerful and it affected me and that is really really meaningful and the fans over here feel that it's really heartfelt and then when i noticed my point is that when david's special aired they cut to a and in that interview section in between interstitially between songs and they had my interview section up and there were 39 million people watching it. And I just thought, well, what? it's that, that, the, so the whole scale is, is way different over here in the oh, East. Yeah. Like 
Absolutely. This, the numbers are just, you could just like move them, move the comma over a couple, you know, it's just the massive audience over here. That's so cool. it's really kind of a pleasure. And I would like to round out my career here if I could, because I'm slowly kind of thinking about bringing the, bringing that baby down for the, for a landing in the next, you know, five years or so. I don't blame you. That's a good place to do it. Oh, Jeff, you had yeah. one more question to, to yeah. do or recall it. I do. I'd like, to, I'd like to put this question out there and this is really for, those uh the sound guys and the engineer people and those people who really love what you do and also maybe do or want to be doing that um with such a strong career and such amazing scenarios that you've been through um what would be that you found has been the 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 saving grace or the you know it's in my back pocket and i can pull this out when things are crazy and I need to figure something out in a scenario with a live show or a new artist that you have to work with. Um, what things can these guys that you learned in that early camp um, always can help you get started that an engineer can learn and, and start to work with to get them on track immediately when working with a new talent, you know, or for a new event or a new show. Um, obviously the concerts are different once you get them going. But initially, boom, do this, do this, do this. This will get you started. Now you can really. Um... That's an easy answer for me. I, I have thought a lot about that. And that's a really good question. The answer is to be able to imbibe an artist's vision of what they want uh, sonically and um, conceptually. Right. Just take a concept that an artist wants. I want this tour to be about getting back at my boyfriend who broke up with me. I want this tour to be about, you know, this this thing or this person or this subject, like imbibe that vision, take it in, let it ruminate, you know, ruminate on it. Let it bake a little bit in there and then just be able to speak an artist's language. So listening to an artist, what they want to do and what their concept is, and then being able to turn their descriptions, especially in the case of somebody like Prince or Gaga, who was, you know, said she wanted me to make her sound like a lavender knife, things like that. What you have to speak artists. And if you can do that as an engineer, if you can understand and listen and pay attention and have a notebook with you and take down notes and then take that vision of what they want to do, a uh, sonic vision and a uh, literal uh, concept and turn that around and make the show reflect and sound like what they want to do you will really be a passive part of that experience that will that that will transcend go right through you as an engineer and it will be and it will get to the fans because i know plenty of engineers who just do what they do they do their thing it's their sound they treat every kick drum the same they treat every vocal the same and that is not what an experienced savvy veteran would do a veteran knows that um you know did you you saw the movie moneyball with Brad Pitt yeah. and oh, yeah. how, how that, how Billy Bean put that baseball team together. When I saw that, I saw that as a metaphor for my career as an engineer. You take, you can take all these different elements that seemingly might not, you might not put the revolution uh, on as individual players and hold them against any other musician in the world. But those five together, right. You know, you have to know how to put things together. And that's the same thing that they did in that movie about baseball team. And that's the same thing that, that I try and do is take all the different elements, put them together and formulate them in a way that best serves the artists themselves and their artistic vision. So if you can, as an engineer or as any uh, creative in, in that, in any industry, imbibe what that artist is trying to say, and then be a passive pass through part of that and it will always end up right. That's a great way to start. Scotty, thank you so so much for coming on the show, man. It has been amazing. I know we I know we definitely went over time. My apologies for, for Oh no, I, I appreciate it very much. I appreciate everybody's attention. Cuz I think it's like it's like almost 10:30 in the morning where you are right now. I think you're exactly 12 hours behind us or something like that. Yeah, right. that's right. But I'm I've, just getting up. <laughs> thank you so so much for coming on the show and sharing these stories. Uh, for the listeners, I hope you guys heard stories that you haven't heard before. I'm pretty sure you have because I listened to a lot of your interviews and I think we covered some things that were not covered. Yeah. Previously, but I know but, you were concerned with that. And hopefully I, I, I sort of weaved some things in that, that, that were, that served the fans the way they want to be served. 
I mean, well, it was an honor to have you on board. And uh, if you guys missed any of the shows, uh, any of the show whatsoever, it will be available tomorrow, um, obviously on Facebook and YouTube as soon as the show's over. But if you miss any of it, you can go to iHeartRadio, you can go to Spotify, you can go to Apple Music, or whatever you will listen to podcasts, and you'll be able to hear the audio version of this show tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm round of applause for Scotty Baldwin in the house. No, yes, sir. no, no, I'm sending you love. I'm glad the camera's off. It's probably better to hear me than see me. I'm always behind the scenes. This is actually like more what it's really like. <laughs> well, I appreciate you, Scotty. Thank you so, so much for joining us tonight. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks, Christopher. Appreciate All it right. very much. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, brother. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Scotty Baldwin. Man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. That was, uh, that was awesome. That was cool. We got a lot of stories out there. And we still got, like, we got, like, some new stuff to talk about, but we'll, like, run through them. Yeah, so, we can. Yeah, let's do it. Run through them. A couple of things. <laughs> yeah, we got a, got, a, got a few things we want to talk about, and I hope all you guys had a great time. This is awesome. Uh, first, I'll tell you, um, we do have, the next guest that we have is a very special guest, um, but I we can't divulge who it is. <laughs> <laughs> we're just there's just so much going on right now but you guys are going to be really happy uh uh it's going to be awesome just wait just, wait i know you're gonna dig this <laughs> <laughs> that's right it's it's going to be a lot of fun so uh just just know it's um don't hate me because i'm beautiful <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be a great show uh, just just know that uh but it won't be a live show. So um just because we're we're doing scheduling things and whatnot. So just just stay put. It's gonna be awesome. Just gonna be awesome. You know what I forgot to ask him? And it it kept on he said it and it messed up my mind and I had a hard time getting back on track after he referred to themselves as Minneapolitans. Oh yeah. <laughs> I was like I've never heard anybody refer to themselves as Minneapolitans before. Uh, mm -hmm. that was, that was new for me. I heard Minnesotans, obviously that refers to the whole state, but for Minneapolis specifically, I, I'm not from Minneapolis. I've been there many times, but I've never heard Minneapolitans. That yeah, was, as soon as he said it, all I thought about was ice cream. <laughs> I couldn't get it out of my head. That's what I write. That's what, uh, that's what Arlene said too, is it sounded like an I kind of ice cream. I was like, oh, <laughs> It's just a mixture of chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry all together in one. We are Minneapolitans. Uh, <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, it like derailed me because the whole time because he was he was he was he was talking for a while, and I said, "Oh dang, I should have uh, Minneapolitans. I should have said something, but I didn't." I was like, that, uh, that it's was okay. Awesome talking to him. I really appreciated. Yeah, all of that. Scott, Scotty's always awesome because he always has great yeah. stories, and and there's so much one-on-one -on -one time that he had with Prince too. I mean, I, it's, yeah. it's kind of, um, you know, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, sorry that it ended the way that it ended with between him and Prince, because he, I don't obviously hindsight's 2020, 20, but it's a little bit, yeah. it, it's got to have a little bit of a weight on somebody to be in a position where you are uh, literally, you could have said to yourself, if I just stayed on for another, another couple of months, I would have, been right. the last people at the board right for his entire career yeah. um I, and well, it's got to think about it at some point in time it's got to kind of and the beauty of it though is he's done great for himself you know he's continued to propel and excel and that's the thing that a lot of people miss you know they they start off and they may be doing great but then something happens and they they just can't quite you know get going and he's he's just maintained and so it's just this is wonderful um all right so let's get to the news obviously you know sheila sheila e has been very very busy mm -hmm. and one of the things that you know one of the things kind of a little disappointing is that you know the last album that she had that we actually saw her here in atlanta and we got a chance mm -hmm. to sit and talk with her uh in atlanta was uh when she released that amazing cd which i don't have in arm's reach uh hella funky um which uh, which is fantastic. And it was like, to me, I think it's one of her, one of her better albums. I mean, especially because it's just mm -hmm. the way that it was constructed was fantastic. Well, That's Sheila awesome. E has another, another album that was released, uh, I believe last month, I think it was Sheila E's Bailar. And of course, uh, 
it's her and Gloria Estefan, and they kind of teamed up for this. And so you already know, all I got to do is tell you Sheila E. and Gloria Estefan, and you already know what this album sounds like. <laughs> it is. With, without even listening to it, you already know what this album sounds like. Uh, and I think they did a she. I think they did a um, they did a show in Miami. I don't think I don't know if it's already happened or it's about to happen. Uh, but Sheila E is is killing it right now, and she is really just embracing culture and just going all in. She is, you know, th- she's always been involved in that, you know, that Latin flair and this album is like pure salsa and she's just she's obviously in her element this is this is what sheila does the best and what her whole family it's right this this is this is what she was raised to do it's kind of like uh it's just you know it's obvious so go make sure you check it out on spotify obviously i always tell you please if you like the album please go out and purchase a physical copy because she doesn't get jack when you guys listen to it on spotify or whatever it's like 0.001 yeah, the stream's not enough by the cup by uh, the record but the it, again check it out because it is an it's it's a, a fantastic album and again you already you already know what you already know what this album sounds like <laughs> Sheila mm-hmm. e gloria stefan just uh, just picture the merging of Sheila E, Miami Sound Machine vibe, just crunching a ball, and you know what this album sounds like. Right, enough said. Uh, we got that one for sure, right? Now you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and a lot of people had a lot to say uh, because without any pomp and circumstance, without any announcement, actually it was, but the announcement was kind of convoluted and, and, and wonked out. But uh, the estate did a release of a re-release of Prince's song, the United States of division. They remastered it. They put the horns more out front and you can listen to it on Spotify. You can also, you can, I don't, I don't know that you can actually purchase a single yet anywhere. Uh, but this is, you know, this is the cover for it and it's on Spotify. It's on title. It's on all of them. And it was released on those platforms before they made the announcement that it was coming it was like kind of there's a they said it was like it's a big announcement coming but it was already it had already been released and i know a lot of times spotify and amazon specifically drop the ball and they go oh we were supposed to not do it now right yet okay my my bad (laughs) and then it's out there yeah i got a special release for you you can buy that book that you just bought (laughs) that's right Yeah, this is the same thing. There's a song coming that you probably already heard. <laughs> There's a song out that you were listening to. But I, I, I like the fact that they're actually still releasing stuff. They're actually still putting stuff out. If you have not heard the new mix, uh, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, it's really different. Um, uh, the horns are more out front. That's for sure. Uh, yeah. They did clean up a lot of the instrumentation. But I, I keep hearing things again, listening in the headphones. I keep hearing things that I don't remember from the original version of this song. Uh, and if somebody who who runs a radio station that plays a lot of prints, I've heard the song enough to when I heard this version, I was like, yeah, there's something else that's different here vocally. There's something else that's going on here and I can't pinpoint it. So at some point in time, I'm going to have to get the the newer version of United States of Division and and the old one and like put them on top of each other in in audacity and just kind of see yeah. what's really different. It's but it's definitely a, a totally different feel. And uh I would if you haven't had an opportunity to check it out, check it out because okay. you know yeah you just gotta you just gotta I have to positive check it I, I hope I Ooh, say yeah. I hope I say this one thing. Uh last show that we did we had two special guests not one but two I'm not going to do these two back to back, but uh, we had uh, we had our good friend Lawrence Law L A W Warrell on the show, and uh, what is awesome is that they are actually he's actually doing a Prince tribute show. I'm trying to do this chronologically too. Uh, those are the two things: the Sheila E album and the United States of Division. They're already there for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is kind of like how the estate did the announcement for it. Uh, this one, however, is future proofed. It is uh, April 11th, which is just two days from now. So if you happen to be in New York, uh, 
law is doing from planet 12 the planet 12 movement law is doing a show at the triad theater in new york new york it's a prince tribute show tickets are only 25 bucks but let me just tell you if you've never seen law perform live it is a high energy show and you're not going to hear like the typical prince yeah. song you're He's going to hear selections always yeah. You're going to hear print songs, but you're going to hear stuff you don't hear tip people typically do live. Uh, yeah. It's you're going to be like, I can't believe he's playing this song. Yeah, and it's going, to happen, yes. it's going to happen a lot if you go Absolutely. see the show. So Law is playing at uh, Triad Theater in New York, New York. So if you happen to be in that area or driving distance in the tri-state area or whatever, I would highly suggest going to check out the show. And it's happening just a couple of days, April 11th, this Thursday. Uh, we still have the link set up on the website, funkatopia.com slash law, F-U-N-K-A-T-O-P-I-A.com slash law. And it will take you right to this page where you can grab the tickets. And if I remember correctly, it was really so close to selling out already so if you click on that link and it's already showing sold out or no tickets available uh just i i accept my accept my apologies because i didn't click on the get tickets thing because i don't want to put anything into a holding pattern if you guys are planning to buy tickets if there's any available i don't know uh so there's that so going in chronological order again uh also we Myself, Mr. Christopher, and Jeff Page are going to be getting on a plane, two different planes, <laughs> two different planes, but we're going to be getting on a plane and going to Minneapolis on April 20th and 21st, uh, but primarily to go see this show right here together, which is pretty friggin' amazing. It is going to be pretty much like an NPG reunion essentially with a bunch of special guests. This is happening April 20th at the Uptown Theater in Minneapolis. Uh, it is Michael Bland. It is Sonny T. It's Levi Caesar Jr. It's Tony M. It's mm -hmm. Tommy Barbarella. It is The Steels. Uh, Margie Cox is going to be there. There's also Chastity Brown. G Sharp is going to be there. Ashley Commodore. Uh, Nerdy is going to be there. DJ Dudley D is going to be doing some... D it's going to be insane. Yeah. And both Jeff Page and myself are going to be at the show in Minneapolis. We are flying in um, and it's going to be it's going to be insane. So if you see us there, please say hello. Uh, we'd love to meet some of you guys in, in person. But if you do not have tickets to the show, I, I don't I, I, this is another one. I don't know if it's already sold out or not, yeah, but I I, it's a massive the last, show. The last time I checked, uh, they had a section that we were talking about the, the the center section was pretty much gone and then i had gone back a few days later and it opened up again so i haven't checked again since then but uh, you know things seem to be shifting so hopefully there's still yeah. some seats so you you will see us there for sure walking around um you'll see us walking around for sure but if you plan to be at the show uh, i i will be i know you're flying out early on uh the 21st right so you're just yeah I'm, just, I'm in and out i'm in for the show well i'm in early for the food and then for the show and then i'm out the next morning yeah. the, this is this so this is happening on uh saturday april 20th i'll be flying out that morning and of course uh you know hanging out doing the regular minneapolis things you know hitting cheapo records uh maybe going to gia maria's for some pizza uh mm -hmm. You know, just doing the normal things that I normally do, eating lunch at Mall of America once I get off the plane, those types of things. Uh, but so this happens Saturday, April 20th. Doors open at 7. The show starts at 8. Uh, Nerdy apparently is going to be, I don't know if he's going to be opening up. I assume that he is. I think Nerdy is opening up because he is, it's, for those who, he performed at the celebration a couple years ago. Um, and it's just him and a DJ. Um, that was a, configuration last time i don't know if that's changed so my guess is that he's going to be opening up and then you got this major show called brothers again which is michael bland and sunny t's show and it's and it's an mpg reunion levi Caesar jr tony m tommy barbarella the steals everybody all in one location which is ridiculous and uh yes we'll be there so make sure you say hello uh and then the following day 
on the 21st uh well actually what did i did i miss a thing um yeah there's a couple things going on i'm gonna i'm gonna skip over martin yeah. just for a second the following day also in mini well that's i'm sorry this is in chanhassen uh is a night to remember at paisley park and what is happening is obviously that is the the eight year anniversary of Prince's passing. And from 10 o'clock until I, I want to say it's 10 o'clock in the morning until it opens at 10 o'clock. There's no two, but it's called a day to reflect. And basically what they're doing is Paisley park is going to open up the MPG music club to the public. Uh, everybody's invited to come and, and leave a memorial on the fence. That's there. Uh, they said, if you're planning to come to Paisley park, make sure that you, you know, if you want to, bring flowers or something to strap to the to the fence or some type of memorial piece to strap to the fence you can do that um and they uh, they will supply some flowers and some message tags but you can also bring whatever you want to to strap uh onto the onto the fence um it's probably the only time you're ever going to hear me use strap and on together on the show <laughs> right uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah. <laughs> see, I, I had to go south of course i had to go south why mm. I, I, it, it, it was a dare i was i was dared just like i will give you 50 bucks if you figure out a way to insert the word strap on into the show tonight okay, strap on <laughs> strap on uh strap off the strapper <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> I know what you were doing. And on that uh, note, <laughs> People's Organic <laughs> Cafe is going to be, oh God, this, it just always goes someplace else. <laughs> People's Organic Cafe is going to be on site all day with food and beverages for people who don't know. Well, People's Organic is like, um, they're kind of like, if you've never been up that way, it's very, very similar to Whole Foods. Uh, they kind of just have a lot of organic stuff, but most of the time I've never had anything at Paisley park. That was, that was a protein <laughs> like, like a meat or anything. So most likely it will be the same things that we normally get like macaroni and cheese and, and cheesecake bars and things that are vegan, but they'll be there as well. But then at the same note to kind of wrap this up 421, which is the date, obviously 421, but also 4 PM 421. Uh, there's a candle lighting that's happening at the MP in the MPG music club. And again, it will also be live streamed, not by us, <clears throat> not by us, but they will be live streamed. Not that we won't, <laughs> but if we can get, a if I can get away with it, I will be live streaming it also, but uh, they will be live streaming it for those who can't join them. Uh, if you guys can't make it, they're doing a candlelight and MPG music club. And then as soon as that's over, I'm out. I have my flight leaves at like eight 30, but I'll be doing the candle lighting uh, thing at Paisley park with all of you guys, whoever's there. And then we'll be leaving. I'll be leaving to go back to Atlanta. Um, but for those that are staying a night to remember, uh, which is what this graphic is a night to remember is a ticketed event. And I don't know how much the tickets are. I did not click on it. Maybe one of you guys can inform me how much it is, but they, it, there's a doors open for a, walkthrough tour that you do on your own. It's a free flowing walkthrough tour. It allows you to kind of look at whatever you want to look at. Uh, just time to reflect in the heart of Paisley park. And then at 7 PM, uh, there is a DJ dance party. That's going to be happening at the MPG music club with DJ Holtz. Uh, and again, people's organic is going to be there as well. And that is all going to be happening April 20th and 21st. And we'll be there. So, uh, yeah, anyways, it is pretty amazing. But let's go back because also on that day, if you happen to be on the other side of the country, on the California side, Martin Kember on April 21st, again, the eighth year anniversary of Prince's passing, is doing the Purple Musicology show at the Venice West and is the celebration of the life and music of Prince. And it is at the Venice West and it's going to be featuring our good friend DJ Alfonso Starr. And it's going to be a pretty amazing show. Again, two shows happening on opposite sides of the world that are going to be a lot of fun to go to. Not the Paisley Park thing won't really be fun. It's a reflecting thing. Of course, the nighttime dance party probably might be fun, 
right? And I won't be there for that. <laughs> um, but I was, I know I mentioned that if I went to Paisley Park uh, in Minneapolis, that I was probably going to try to do a candlelight ceremony uh, at you know, down by Riley Creek. And um, which is what this picture is behind uh, that's our backdrop here. This is actually a picture from Riley Creek, which is the graffiti bridge. Uh, and that Funkatopia spray paint thing is actually there. So if you go to Riley Creek across from Paisley Park, you will see that. That's uh, but anyways, we're talking about the other side of the world, which is over in Venice, California. This Martin Kember and the unit are going to be, and DJ Alfonso Starr are going to be doing Purple Musicology at the Venice West. And you can go to, what do we set this up as? I think it's Funkatopia.com slash Martin. M-A-R-T-I-N, what I think that it is, uh, that will take you right to the tickets for this. But you can go also go to thevenicewest.com and you can get tickets for that show as well. So there's tons of things going on. Now, Plenty. Uh, a couple more quick things to talk about for sure. Uh, also happening, we're, we're going to probably talk about this later for sure. Um, in May, mm. this is something new. In May, at the end of May, Sunday, May 26th, there is going to be a screening of Purple Rain, a 40th anniversary screening and panel. So they're going to be playing the music, playing the movie uh, at this venue that is in uh, downtown, called at the Regent in downtown Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, Funk, uh, Dr. Funkenberry is going to be there, and also Jerome Benton, Jill Jones, and Andre Simone, and other special guests are going to be there. On May 26th, uh, again, it's uh, doors open at four. There's a 5 p.m. 5 p.m. screen, 5 p.m. screening. I don't know why I was having a difficult time saying that. Uh, and I don't. You can go to, for your tickets are at FootlongDevelopment.com. That's FootlongDevelopment.com. But they're going to be showing the movie Purple Rain, and it's going to be pretty cool because not only do you get to see Purple Rain with a bunch of other like-minded uh, purple heads, mm -hmm. uh, but also, again, it's going to be hosted by Dr. Funkenberry, and then you've got Jerome Benton, you've got Jill Jones, you've got Andre Simone, and whoever the other special guests may be. There's a lot of those folks are over in L.A. Actually, uh, Jay is over there in L.A., so this is good for him because it's right there in his hometown. It's like something happened in Atlanta for us, you know? Exactly. So it's very, very cool. That's May 26th, uh, which is going to be a pretty cool event. And obviously, uh, if I was, if I had extra time to go over there i would but unfortunately one month later i'll be <laughs> we'll be up there for the celebration uh so it's kind of like while i would love to go to this um we're going to be at the celebration and that's the other thing that we the final thing that we'll talk about tonight uh, obviously is the celebration at paisley park we're not really going to talk a bunch about it but it's happening june 20th through the 24th uh, we all know about it. We've been talking about it, but until they give some other information like the host hotel uh, and some of the other timely details, we will do a full blown show talking about the celebration. Uh, for those who have never been to the celebration before, we will talk to you all, all about, you know, the best places to stay, where you should fly into uh, some of the things that you can take advantage of while you're in town, all that stuff. Uh, one of the things I can tell you, and I did actually check this, uh, if you go to princecelebration.com, uh, that is another, that's a, a, it is a website that we set up and all of the shows that are appearing or happening in and around Minneapolis during the celebration, uh, are being posted up there by the one and only Bonnie Freshore. Um, she is updating all those, all the, all the shows, not only just for the celebration, but other stuff that's happening in and around town. Uh, in she does an awesome job yeah. keeping track of all that. So if you want to go to princecelebration.com, I know there was some weird plugin issue that we, that we had that was kicking people to some dating website, some plugin went rogue. Uh, so we killed that plugin, but princecelebration.com, you can get all kinds of information about other shows that are going on. Uh, in town and as it gets closer to june you will see all types of stuff appear on that website um there'll be like shows everywhere so that when you come into minneapolis for the celebration you not only can look well we can not only talk about the schedule but we can also show you other things that are happening in and around minneapolis uh st paul in that area that 
you can make the most. So when, once you're done at the celebration, you can get in a car and go to downtown Minneapolis and maybe see somebody like LP, which is Eric Leeds and uh, St. Paul Peterson's project, or uh, maybe some Minneapolis all-stars or whatever's going on. There's like always shows that are happening everywhere. Could possibly Jesse Johnson is currently touring. I've been seeing the clips that have been happening from, uh, California that happened this previous week. So lots of stuff going on, man. Lots of stuff. As I mentioned, I cannot, um, next week we will have a show. We will be here. That's going to happen. We, we will be here. Uh, however, um, we're going to be pre-recording the show and we'll, I'll, I'll share it with you after everything's done. We just got, there's, there's a lot going on, but it's going to be a great show. Just know that's coming. It's going to be a pretty fantastic show. Um, and we'll divulge it who it is later. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's called a cliffhanger, folks. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, thank you guys so so much for tuning in. I know it's uh, it's been a late night. It's been a long show. I hope everybody had a great time. Again, if you missed any of the show, you can obviously go to iHeartRadio, Spotify, Odyssey, Apple Music, wherever you listen to podcasts, and you can check out the audio version of the show that we will, I will post up there tomorrow. As soon as this show's over, the video version is going to be immediately available on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. So if you want to like go right at it right now, go for it. Uh, and also will appear, the audio version will appear on the app as well. So if you download the funked up app, you will, the first page that you'll see, you'll see the interview from today and you'll be able to take a listen. And it's been a lot of fun. I hope you guys had a good time. WTF, welcome to Funkatopia. I hope you guys had a fantastic time. Again, I am your host, Mr. Christopher. That is Jeff Page over on that side. <laughs> <laughs> What's going to be funny is that you don't understand. Last time he was in Minneapolis, he had to do that like probably like two dozen times the whole time we were there. It's like I was like looking around trying to find out where where is where's Jeff at? I can't find Jeff. And all of a sudden I I hear bow, 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 in the back and I'm like, oh, I know where he's, he's over there. <laughs> <laughs> People approach me that way. They Jeff, hey, bow, bow, bow. and I'm like, oh, here we go. <laughs> or I don't remember his name. It's like, oh, you're a bow, 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 guy. He's <laughs> <laughs> the fur fur guy. He's the furry. He's the fur 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 guy. Hey, what's up, fur fur fur? Mr. Fur fur fur. How do you even spell that? Uh, <laughs> F E E R F E E R. Yeah. <laughs> Just not F U R. That's <laughs> fur, 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 fur. <laughs> gonna be the furry. It's F E H R is that furry. Uh I'll thank you, Julie. Thank you. Yeah, thank see, uh Julie says uh liking the hair, Jeff. See, I said, Oh, what you do with your hair? Did you cut it? And he's like, No, I just pulled it back. But I it's the first time I've seen him with it pulled back, but it's got this ledge top now so it's kind of oh i sneezed light socket the whole nine <laughs> he whipped whiplash his hair into submission <laughs> the old hair twist <laughs> head spin all right well everybody thank you so so much for joining us thank you once again to the one and only amazing scotty baldwin who came and shared a bunch of different stories man yeah, what come fun. back it's going to be an amazing show. We will see you next week with another amazing show. And uh, I hope to drop that information ASAP as soon as possible. For right now, thank you guys for tuning in. Good night, Funkatopians. We'll see you soon. ASAP. As soon as possible. Good night. Good night. <laughs>